it makes fat loss and health and fitness much more sustainable. A lot more flexibility. Yeah, yeah like, like uh, you know, how great would it be if you could eat more and be leaner, right? That allows you the ability to live in the world and to eat and to enjoy yourself sometimes and not have to be so strict. Now, you can be super strict if you want and be crazy about counting calories, but the approach that I've seen that works is let's give somebody a larger buffer. Let's get their metabolism to burn more calories because I know that they're going to have the occasional meal that's high in calories. They're going to have that dinner on the weekend or they're going to go on vacation. And um, I, I don't want to see them rebound. I want to see them be able to burn it off just on their own. And there is a predictable way to do this. And that's what we're going to go over right now. It's literally, if you follow these steps and you're patient with it, you will get a metabolism that burns more calories. Now, the exact amount of more calories you'll burn, that's up to a lot of different factors, including genetics, body size, and so on. But you will see a boost in your body's metabolic rate if you follow, if you do the following. So let's start with the first one, which is you want your exercise regime. So when you look at like your, your, your whole health regime, right? And you're like, okay, I want to lose weight. I want to be healthy. I want to be fit. And we're talking about boosting metabolism. The exercise portion should be primarily focused on building muscle. That should be the foundation of your routine because nothing will boost your metabolism more on its own than having more active muscle. Muscle is expensive. It costs a lot of energy. It's, now, the brain burns more calories than muscle on a pound-for-pound -pound basis, but you can't build your brain necessarily, right? But you can build muscle. So building muscle is, is, is one of the most effective strategies to boost your metabolism. So when you look at your workout, look at what you're doing and say, is this workout muscle building or is it endurance building or is it flexibility building or is it... So the cornerstone, the focus should be on muscle building if you want a faster so, metabolism. So not circuit training. Not, Correct. Not, you know, uh, signing cardio. up for a race, not some Not athletic running, class. not cycling, not Orange Theory, yeah. not any of that stuff. It's literally strength training. Yep. It's lifting weights, right? The stuff that builds Longer muscle. rest periods, yeah. What, what builds muscle and strength. So it's going to look a lot differently than uh, what you're marketed to the most for, for burning calories. Yes, by, by, the, by the way, this would be the recommendation regardless of what you knew about this person's history. Almost always, right? So even, always. no matter what. But what's interesting about this is the people that tend to fall in this trap of having struggling with the yo-yo dieting and, and, and losing the weight and being stuck here all the time happen to be the people that tend to not train this way too. So you kind of get a double benefit. Yeah, You get the benefit of this is what they should be doing anyways to help speed the metabolism up. But you also get the novelty benefit of, oh, I'm the type of person that loves the circuit class or I love to train like an athlete or I love to sign up for a marathon when I try and get in shape. And so you not only get a benefit of like, this is one of the ideal ways for you to train to build a faster metabolism, but you also get the benefits of it because it's so novel for that person. Yeah, so so think of it this way. Now, some someone may be listening, like, God, circuit training burns so many calories though. Running burns so many calories. It's true. If you run for an hour, you're going to burn a lot more calories than if you lift weights to build muscle. Okay, that's a fact. However, lifting weights to build muscle is like taking money and, and investing it and then allowing that money to make money for you. So think of it this way. You could take a job where you make a lot per hour or you could take a job where you make a little less per hour. However, you also get stock options and you know for a fact that this company is growing and go public. That's the difference. The difference is we're taking our training and we're gearing it towards investment. Can I get my metabolism to boost more so it burns more on its own versus let me try and burn this all on my own. By the way, if you're if you're not trying to train to build muscle and you're just burning a lot of calories, your body does a phenomenal way of adapting to that because your body's always trying to conserve energy. So if I just burn a lot of calories without a signal to build muscle, I will burn a lot of calories initially, but over time, my body's going to figure out ways to slow its own metabolism down, to make me more efficient. And one of the main ways it does this is to actually get you to lose muscle. This is why studies will show diet. So people cut their calories plus lots of cardio, which is not strength training, right? It's not muscle building, but it is a lot of calorie burning. They'll see weight loss, but a chunk of that weight loss is muscle. How did that happen? Your body didn't burn the muscle off. Your body said, Hey, we're burning a lot of calories. We don't need a lot of strength. So let's become better at this activity by burning less calories. And so it actually starts to adapt. Efficiency. Yes. Yeah, so when you train for muscle, your body is saying, well, we're not burning a lot of calories. We're not even worried about that. In fact, what we need is more strength. We need more muscle. Keep packing it on. And when you combine it with the rest we're going to talk about, that's how you get the, the faster metabolism. Yeah. Let's talk about the exercises, right? So, so building muscle, training for muscle building is traditional strength training for the most part. Like bodybuilders or powerlifters or strength athletes. That's how you want to work out. 
But what about the exercises? What exercises are going to give you the most bang for your buck, especially if you're somebody that's only going to work out two or three days a week? Well, the evidence is clear. It's the big compound lifts. Mm-hmm. It's the it's the big gross motor movements, the, the barbell exercises, a barbell squat, a barbell bench press, a deadlift, a row, a overhead press. These exercises, just for the time spent doing them, gives you the most in terms of me- metabolism boosting, the most in terms of muscle building. It would, it would require a lot of exercises combined to equal the muscle building effect of just one of those exercises. And when it comes in terms of time and recovery ability and all that stuff, it just makes sense to do the one, the yeah. exercises that give you the most bang for your buck. Yeah, body. because they're multi-joint compound lifts, it's going to require so much more output and, uh, and your body's going to have to work that much harder um, to, to produce, you know, strength for these types of lifts. And so the, the demand of those alone, um, it, it's going to move you so much further than a lot of these other exercises out there. Um, you know, that, that may be promoted a lot as like hypertrophy or like building muscle, um, really the, the most demanding, the largest signal you can produce through those, um, you know, barbell lifts where it's like, uh, you know, heavy emphasis on all these muscle groups having to work together. Totally. It, that's really what it's about. Well, when we, we also said that, you know, the manual burn is, is less important, but what's nice about building a routine that's around these compound lifts is you actually burn a ton of calories. So even though it's less of a priority uh, to burn a bunch of calories in your workout, now you're talking about a weight training uh, routine that actually rivals running and some of these circuit training classes. You put somebody in a, you know, orange theory circuit class or, you know, somebody who just is running a circuit or athletic training with plyometrics and stuff. And you give me somebody and I do a bunch of, you know, squats, deadlifts, overhead pressing, bench press for an hour with like tight on my rest periods, like being sticking to the actual true rest periods and going all the way through. Huh, you would be surprised how close the calorie burn is. It you won't it won't be that crazy yeah. significant of a difference. Well, the way I like to look at it like this, just really simplify it. Like I could do a, a curl for my biceps and I'll build my biceps, right? And the biceps are, you know, a muscle on the top of my arm and it's kind of a small muscle. Or I could do a pull up. A pull-up is also working the biceps, but it's also working all, all my back muscles, right? My lats, my rhomboids, there's a little bit of trapezius uh, activity. So I'm working more muscles in that same period of time. You do three sets of curls, I do three sets of pull-ups. We both worked our biceps, but I also worked all this other stuff. And so it just beca- it's just an efficient, effective way to train to send the loudest muscle building signal. The other person doing just the curls would have to add other exercises to hit all those other muscles, right. which is fine it if you want to spend- It requires a lot more volume. It does. It requires a lot more volume. but And then you run into, you know, this is more complex getting into the weeds, but you run into more adaptation issues. Is it too much volume? How much training am I doing? You know, strength training really is about sending the signal and then leaving it alone. It's like giving the body a reason to build muscle and then that's it because the yeah. the the what you get out of it is not while you do it. Unlike- calorie burning type workouts like cardio, the value is in the cardio itself, um, unless you're trying to build endurance, which here we're talking about boosting metabolism. With When it comes to metabolism boosting, it doesn't happen in the workout with strength training. It happens after through the adaptation. And so these big compound lifts just do the most. I mean, how many exercises would it take, you know, single joint exercises would take to really have the same effect as a barbell squat? Yeah. I'd have to put together like five, five or six, yeah. six different exercises. At least, at least. calf, hamstring, quad, low back, yeah. upper back, you know, core, so, yeah, yeah. core. Like, yeah, no way. Right. So you want to, basically what you want to do is you want to, your routine should be centered around these big compound lifts, getting strong at them. And then if you want to add other extra stuff, you could definitely do that. But again, the, the foundation should be building muscle and the foundation within that foundation should be these, these compound lifts. Well, and the, and the next point is to focus on getting strong in those lifts. That's the best metric for it's this. Just, I'm just get, get strong, get good at them. That's all I'm thinking about. I'm training this person. We're trying to, and that's what, what's crazy about this. When you think about it is you also got to picture this, this client, this client is really overweight. They've struggled with weight loss their whole life. They come to you and they're like, Adam, I just want to lose as much weight as I possibly can. Can you please help me? I've struggled my whole life. And I'm like, all right, we're going to get strong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a, that's a hard conversation. Yeah. It's a tough conversation to have with, with someone that's in that place. That's not how they're thinking. They're, they're thinking we got to burn this off. We got to melt this off. I got to sacrifice. I got to hold, got to cut back calories. And you're kind of like, no, you know what? I'm going to keep you fed and we're going to, we're going to get strong right now. Yeah. Just, just trust me. That's what we want to do. But so, I mean, I just want to, 
make that point that I, I understand uh, if if this resonates with you that you've struggled with weight loss in the past, you've yo-yoed back and forth and you can't seem to get to that goal weight or whatever you have. This is made. This is the major mental hurdle piece right here. This part where it it yeah, doesn't. You don't seem, think what does strength have to do with fat yeah. loss? Right. You don't realize that. But what strength? What strength? The reason why it's such an it's, incredible metric is if you get stronger, if you're getting stronger it, relatively consistently over time, you can pretty much guarantee that your metabolism is probably boosting at the same time. Yeah. It, it's one of those physical pursuits that as it improves it probably means the metabolism boosting as well. This is not true of other physical pursuits. If you increase your flexibility or your stamina over time, that does not mean your metabolism is getting faster or hotter, right? But strength typically means that. So the best metric when it comes to boosting metabolism to measure, if you just use a single metric of strength, am I getting stronger? Yeah. Yes, I'm going in the it's right the direction. the best metric for uh, realizing that you have everything in the right direction in terms of like, hormones being balanced in terms of like recovery um, and in terms of like you being able to have and see real progression because everything else uh, doesn't really work. Um, it, you know, if you have any of those components out of, out of order, out of balance, you're not going to see a lot of strength gains as a result. Yeah. Well, it also goes hand in hand with the, the next point, which is making sure that you, you feed the body what it needs in order to, to build this muscle. Yes. Right? Because if I ever see anybody fall short here, they, they figure it out. They're like, oh, okay, okay, I get it. We need to build the metabolism. We need to build some muscle. So we need to lift heavy. Okay, I'm, I'm with you. But then they still struggle with the nutrition piece. They're still like, I was eating jack in the box. Also, I'm cutting all that out. Now they're eating chicken salads and they're like eating twice a day. So they and, cut their calories low. So yeah, so yeah. they reduce their calories and then they're not seeing the strength gains like we want to see inside the gym. And then I come back and I find out later on, it's like, oh, well, that's because you took our calories from 4,000 calories to 1,200 calories because yeah. you're afraid to eat when I need you to eat, you're not going to build tissue out of nowhere. You, you, yeah, those need, building it, materials aren't there. No, right. you have to fuel the body. So there's there's two things that are happening. One is the strength training is sending a signal to build muscle and build strength. Two, the way that you eat also sends a signal. And that signal can say, uh, we can build this muscle. We can afford to build this muscle. We can afford to have a fast metabolism because we have the food. Or it can say, you know, I know you're trying to get stronger, but we don't got enough calories. We don't got enough food. So we're not going to do that. We're not going to build muscle. We're not going to build strength. We're going to keep things as efficient as possible because the calories are too low. So you have to do both. You have to not only build strength and build muscle, but you also have to feed yourself at least enough to allow that to happen. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean you go crazy with your food intake, but you got to fuel those things, right? So if you send the signal to build muscle, imagine a bunch of workers, right? You got a bunch of workers and you're like, here's the instructions, build the house. And they're like, all right, where's the bricks? Oh, there's no bricks. Yeah. You can't build a house. So you got to provide the materials as well by feeding your body. Because if you cut your calories too low while strength training, um, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. There are conflicting signals and the boost in the metabolism that you're expecting, even though your strength training is just simply not going to happen. So feed your body to fuel muscle and strength. Um, and I think we can get a little deeper into that, right? Yeah. 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 So the next thing is to slowly increase calories as the body adapts. So we're feeding the body, so you may be wondering, well, what does that look like? How many calories? What, what, what am I going to do here? One of the best things to do is to first off figure out how many calories you're eating just to maintain your body weight. Um, easy way to do this is to track. So take your, your normal food intake over the next couple of weeks, write it down or enter it into an app. They make wonderful, <clears throat> super convenient apps now. And once you figure out how many calories you're generally eating and you know to maintain your body weight, that's your starting point. Then you start the strength training. And then what you do is you slowly, very slowly, bump those calories up just a little bit. And I, at first, I like to not bump the calories. I like to wait for the strength things to happen a little bit. And then I bump the calories. But what I don't do is cut the calories with the strength training. I keep them the same at first, and then I start to bump them. Yeah, I normally don't have to do much of adjusting calorie-wise at first. It's really just kind of switching the macros when I find, uh, when I do, when I assess a diet first. Like, so let's take the example. I know I use an extreme analogy of somebody who's, eating fast food all day, but typically there's there's uh, some uh, unhealthy or poor choices in our nutrition when we're when we're way overweight, right? So I literally look at their just their average caloric intake for a week. And then I just make sure that we're we're hitting protein targets and we're we're making better food choices, but we're keeping the calories about the same. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to cut. I don't really need to add anything quite yet. I'm just gonna say 
because what it, oh, I find almost always is they're they're lacking a macronutrient. We're not getting enough healthy fats. We're not getting enough protein. We're eating too much sugar. We're not Fiber's getting enough fiber. Yeah. yeah, we never eat vegetables. So there's always there's always a, a a handful of things that I know that they we could be adding to the diet or making better. And so I just simply go like, okay, let's keep your calories about the same. But then um, you know instead of this meal and this meal that you normally would do here, like I, I prefer you eat this this instead. So let's add this in here. Let's add that in there. Sure. And and then just let and then watch how the body responds. And many times you will see the client get a little stronger, lean out a little bit, and you're not even having to adjust calories in any direction. What that yet. usually looks like is uh, I'm stronger in the gym, so I can I'm I'm lifting you know ten or fifteen or twenty pounds more on some of those big lifts that we talked about. My weight hasn't moved on the scale, but I do notice that my clothes are starting to fit differently. Now, when I would have clients, I could do body fat tests so I could tell them exactly what was happening. And usually, what I would see during this initial period of time was uh, a, a transfer or a, sh or a change in body composition, I should say, right? Body fat went down, muscle went up. And it usually is about the same. In other words, they gained two pounds of muscle, lost two pounds of body fat, something along those lines. So the scale hasn't changed, although we have more muscle, less body fat, meaning they have a faster metabolism, they're stronger, and they're smaller. This is another important point to make here is that muscle is dense in comparison to fat. It takes up something a little bit more than three-fourths the space that body fat will take up. So if you lost 15 pounds of body fat and replaced it with 15 pounds of muscle, you would weigh the same, but you would lose almost a quarter of the size right. on so your you body. you look significantly smaller, even though the scale said exactly the You'd same. You'd be smaller. And so what you should expect if you're not doing body fat tests and stuff is like, okay, I'm stronger. My weight's the same, but I feel different. My body feels tighter and my clothes fit a little differently. In men, it usually looks like a, a weight, the waist is a little looser. Um, in women, same thing. You also may notice as a woman that around the butt might feel a little tighter. Don't freak out. It's because your butt is probably building. And I want to say that because sometimes people freak out. Like, I yeah. thought you said I was going to get smaller. Well, the butt's a muscle. Mm -hmm. It tends to lift uh, and build a little bit. And then you may get comments. This was my favorite part. When clients would do this and they wouldn't change on the scale, uh, so their weight would stay the same for the first couple months, they'd come to me like, you know what's weird, Sal? People keep asking me how much weight I've lost. Do you guys ever have clients? Not only that, that, but I'm so glad you said this because this is an, an area that is really challenging also to overcome. You tell a client to increase calories, you tell them to focus on building strength, and not only maybe does the scale not move in the direction they want, but then they also start filling out their clothes and their clothes look tighter. But I promise it looks, <laughs> it'll look better yeah. on you. And so that's the part that's really tough because we associate like where we're at, like if we look good or we don't look mm -hmm. good off sometimes how our clothes is fitting. Mm -hmm. And it's like you you get a girl who all of a sudden her thighs and her butt and her jeans is filling out and it's tighter and you she was asking you to lose weight and she might start right, freaking out. pull them all the way up. Yeah, but now her butt's sitting up two more inches and she has defined hamstrings you yeah. when she didn't have before yeah. coming in you. So it's like, so you have to understand there is this kind of sculpting process that happens yes. and it's a slow, gradual process. And just... Just because the pants are fitting tighter doesn't necessarily mean you're going the wrong direction. In fact, that may mean you're doing incredible right now, especially if you can be objective and go, you know what, actually, if I compared this picture of me today versus the picture just two weeks ago, I know the scale is saying the same, or even I'm up two pounds, but you know, I do. I think I do look a little bit better here than I did two weeks ago. And you should be able to see that, especially in a two weeks time. I oh yeah, I mean, I, I used to love it. Clients would come to me and say that they're like, "Wow, oh, it's weird. People are asking me how much weight I've lost, and I've only lost a pound on the scale. And it's really weird. Before I'd lose ten pounds and nobody noticed. I'm like, well, you look different. Your body is holding less body fat. It's got more muscle. Muscle looks very good. I mean, a, a one hundred and fifty pound female at twenty percent body fat versus a one hundred and fifty pound female at thirty two percent body fat. Same height and everything. If you saw them stand next to each other, would look dramatically different. Dramatically mm -hmm. different. You could do this with a two hundred pound male as well. They would look dramatically different. So unless your weight is important to some extent, but nobody walks around with a scale. Nobody really cares. It's really about how you feel. Of course, how you look, your health, and body fat just takes up a lot of space. And in, in, you know, unless it's when, once it gets past a certain point, it doesn't look good. Muscle looks really good. It's tight and sculpted. And so in these initial stages of boosting metabolism, I want everybody, I want to be very clear in the initial stages, you should expect to not lose any weight. You should expect to look and feel different, but you should not expect to lose any weight. You should expect to be stronger and start to see the initial effects of the metabolism boosting.
Now, what would you say uh, the difference would be in, uh, between that and like a reverse diet where somebody's trying to come out of like a quote unquote broken metabolism or they went on this extreme diet? It's pretty much the same protocol, same protocol. to get back, right? It's the same protocol. And we would, in fact, uh, although we would keep the calories roughly the same to start with, we would reverse them mm -hmm. at some point, meaning slowly increase. That's what I, I mentioned earlier. You slowly increase the calories to fuel the metabolism. So someone may be wondering, how do I know? when to stop? Like, when do I stop this reverse diet period? When do I, when do I start to really focus on the fat loss? Well, it's different from person to person, but typically I tell someone when you get to the point where you feel like you're eating a lot of food mm -hmm. and you feel really good and you feel like you could cut your food and be okay at that point. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off this guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Then we cut the calories. You've got the muscle. You've got the metabolism. And then the fat loss happens. And I'll say this. I've seen this happen, I mean, a lot of times, many times. I would say at least half the times I've trained people where they'll lose 20, 30 pounds and at the end of the process eat as much or more at the end of that weight loss process than they did going into it. You can't say that about traditional, just cutting the calories and trying to burn oh, calories. Oh, no, definitely. I yeah. remember, I did this even with somebody who's healthy and in shape. So this doesn't apply just to a broken metabolism or just someone trying to lose weight. I mean, I remember when I was training Melissa for her uh, bikini competition. Right. And when I first got her, I her calories were around 1,800 or 1,900 to keep herself relatively. She looked great. She was in good shape. She wasn't bikini ready, but she was in good shape. And I said, I first want to, I want to ramp your metabolism up before we get into prep. So we trained for the three to four months before, and the goal was to just get her caloric intake as high as we possibly could, maintaining her you know, weight and body about where it's at so that when we decide to go into a cut, we have all this room. And what ended up happening was we ramped her all the way up to, I think, 27 or 2,100 calories. That's almost a thousand. So when she was in peak week, she was eating at what she was when I first got her. So think about that. And like, that's extreme dieting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah that was our that's on peak stage. week. Extreme, yeah. the, the lowest of low weeks and, and hardest for most people is that final week going to stage. And that's what she was eating on a normal week when I got a hold of her when we first started. So this, this idea and concept isn't only for someone who has a broken metabolism or someone who has yo-yo yeah. dieted back and forth or someone who just wants to lose 50 to 100 pounds. I mean, you could take this, this really for me, it's that, do you want more metabolic flexibility? Do you want the ability to have a burger and fries every once in a while and not feel like it sticks right to you, to feel like you can you can enjoy a night with a glass of wine and eating out and not feel like all that gets right. stuck to you? And so that's why, to your point, Sal, there is such a huge variant. And that's exactly how I ask clients. I go, well, where would you like to be? You know, I, I, it's not, it's not for me to decide just cause you are so tall and so, and you weigh so much that, oh, you should have a metabolism that burns X amount of calories. It's like, listen, if you feel very satisfied and you like the amount of calories you eat and it gives you some freedom to, you know, eat, eat out every once in a while and maintain your, then you're fine. But if you go, man, Adam, I feel like I, I can't get away with anything. And I, I eat yeah. so tight and clean. And if I eat one bad thing, well, then that's the case. Then this is, this is for you. Even if you are considered a quote unquote fit person. Yes. Now the next point, and this has to do with nutrition also is to prioritize protein. So protein, number one, a high protein diet. When I say high protein, it's about 0.6 to a gram of protein per pound of body weight in normal weight individuals. So take your body weight and a little more than half your body weight up to your body weight in grams of protein is what you're aiming for. The higher amount tends to work better. So I said 0.6 to one, closer to one tends to work better uh, in my experience, but it builds more muscle, which boosts the metabolism. It also on its own has more of what's called a thermogenic, thermogenic effect, meaning a gram of protein actually burns more calories than a gram of carbs or a gram of fat. So protein also has this effect where it burns more calories on its own. It's nominal. It's not a huge effect, but over time it makes a difference. And then here's the third reason why I, I like prioritizing protein. It's very satiating. It's very, mm -hmm. very satiating. So when you're eating a high protein diet, especially at the end when you've lost the weight and everything, high protein tends to make you feel more satisfied, more balanced energy. You maintain more of the muscle. So when you're doing this kind of reverse diet process through through strength and in combined with strength training, prioritize protein. What does that look like? Every meal, make sure you eat the protein first. Figure out how much protein you need for the day. Divide it by your meals. 
eat that first, then eat everything else, and the rest typically takes care of itself. I find this even more important than the whole calorie thing, even though I understand that that uh, if we're in a deficit, we're going to lose. If we're in a surplus, we're going to gain, and that's that's the sun, we're not breaking the, those laws, right, of physics. But I definitely think that for the average person, just learning how to focus on hitting what your pro what your protein intake, your daily protein intake should be in order to build muscle that. That by itself and just yeah. focusing on it, it kind of takes care of a lot of things. It does. If it's whole foods, you'll typically yes. get the calories. It's hard to yeah. do. It really is. For for most people, it is hard to consistently get enough protein in day in and mm -hmm. day out to for the optimal amount, you know, so ideal amount of protein that you are to build muscle, consistently do that. And if you do that, I think I feel like the other things kind of take care of themselves. Well, it's so. interesting because it's so satiating, it's it's easier to like eat less, but but if you're not seeking protein, it's it because it's so satisfying, it's easy to not eat it if you're yeah. eating everything else with it, if that right. makes sense. Right. Yeah, yeah. no, no. But if you eat the protein first. You're going to build more muscle. You're going to get more of what you need, and you're going to feel better from a satiety standpoint, especially at the end when you finally do cut your calories after this process of, of boosting your metabolism. We, we say this a lot, and I want to add to this because I think this is important. Is that like it's to me? It's not only do you eat protein first, but it it has to be protein in there. In other words, like I, I brought up the other day when we were talking, had a similar conversation. And so let's say you, oh, the guys say eat protein first. They have their breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they always make sure to eat their protein in that order. But then they have these like snacks in between. Oh, grapes here and some almonds there. And like, and they, and it's like what ends up happening is they tend to mostly snack on carbs or fat, like an almond or what that. And you, you end up hitting your calorie budget for the day and still don't hit your protein intake because your three small meals only mm. had 30 grams a piece, which is 90 total. Uh, grams of protein and your body needs, let's say, let's for argument's sake, 180. And then you fill the rest of your calories up with the grapes, the almonds and some, yeah. what we would call healthy snacks, but because it, you weren't protein focused, you ended up still hitting your calorie intake and not getting enough protein. So it's like, Everything needs to be protein focused. If you're going to have a snack, then I'm thinking, okay, I need to get my what's my, a good protein, yeah, a snack? majority of protein first, and then I can have those almonds with it, or I can have those grapes with it, not them by themselves. Or else, what ends up happening is you kind of graze all day, and you end up hitting your caloric intake. You can't do any more, and then you're short on protein. That's yeah. super common. Yep. All right. So this next one, this is probably the more controversial part of this, which is to use cardio for health during this period, but not for the calorie burn. Okay. So what do I mean by that? Well. Movement's good for you, and cardiovascular activity does have health benefits, and studies will show that the, the best health benefits you'll get out of exercise is a combination of strength training and cardiovascular training. Now, if you had to pick one over the other, strength training beats out cardio. We've done many episodes on this, but ideally, you want to do a little bit of both, um, and in this particular scenario with boosting metabolism, the focus should be strength training, and cardio should be kind of like this added part. And really just for health. And if in, in ideally, if, if we're doing it for health, it's walking. Really, it's about going for walks during the day. Now, if you want more stamina, you could push the stamina a little bit. But the problem with using cardio for the calorie burn is when I push cardio to burn calories, I'm telling my body to become more efficient with calories. I'm telling my body uh, I don't want a lot of muscle because I don't want a lot of burn a lot of calories. I want endurance. I don't need so much strength. And so what will happen is you'll get less of that muscle building. So if you're training to build muscle and you're also training hard to burn lots of calories with cardio, you'll get less muscle as a result of that and less of a metabolism It's boost. always walking for me unless the, the only ex exception to the rule for me is if that's a client who has some sort of a routine that they've always done. I'll give you an example. My brother-in-law is a diehard downhill mountain biker. He It's very intense, burns a ton of calories, very endurance, stamina-based, and he rides uh, twice on the weekends for so two days of these like three-hour rides. But he does that year-round, nonstop, doesn't matter if he's fat, skinny, on his workout program, not on his workout program. So It's a passion for yeah, him. Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build that. So, so insert, you know, paddle boarding, insert running mm -hmm. for an hour on the weekends, insert your favorite class you always do. Like if it is something you love to do, regardless of your, your body composition and it's a passion for you, or, you know, play pickup basketball, you know, three times a week or like that, then I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm going to tell them they can't do that because that's something that they love to do. And then it's got other benefits just for besides calorie and even the health benefits of what it does for your heart. So those people, everybody else, if we're starting on this routine, I'm, I do not want 
any of that type of, all I want is walking. You feel like, you know, you normally wouldn't get out and you feel you're, you're, you feel good on your diet and you're happy you're doing this new weight routine and you don't want to just sit around and watch TV. Okay, go for a walk, go for a hike, go, yep. go move around, go to a park, go to a zoo, go walk around for a while. I'm all for that. Don't go get on a treadmill yeah, and, general kick, activity. and kick ass for an hour because that is not going to help us in our pursuit, right? Even though you may think that. Yeah, because that whole math thing's a trap when you, especially when you start associating those calories with like a, a meal that you just had. Yes. And you start looking at how many calories you can then transfer over on the treadmill to sort of absolve you of those calories. That's just a, a war you're never going to win. Yeah. Think of it this way I'm going to oversimplify it. So I know it's not this simple. So everybody relax. But let, let, let's say you're looking at your, you're doing this and you're like, wow, my body now is burning. 2,300 calories a day. If I just got on that treadmill and ran as hard as I could for an hour, I could make it like 2,600 calories a day. So that's what I'm going to do. And initially that's what will happen. You'll burn an extra, whatever, 300 calories or so. But then what happens, your body starts to adapt towards stamina and endurance and it starts to slow its metabolism down. Eventually you're back down to burning 2,300 calories or less in the, with doing the extra running on the treadmill. So now you're doing more work to get the same or worse results. So if you want to boost your metabolism, don't do cardio for the calorie burn. Do it for health, which is totally fine, but don't worry about the calorie burn. Our goal is to boost your metabolism. Our goal is not to get you to burn more calories manually and do a lot more work. Remember, we're looking at sustainability. We're looking at fat loss forever, not just in the short term. Mm -hmm. All right, the last one, and this one's very important because um, this could definitely throw a wrench in the whole machine, which is to prioritize good sleep. So Poor sleep is a tremendous stress on the body. And just because of the way we evolved, when we were when we were under chronic stress, it was probably due to the fact that we couldn't find calories. So the two types of stress that we'll typically encounter is acute. Something happened right now. Car almost hit me. It's gone. Oh, let me calm down now. The car, I'm safe. The other one is kind of chronic stress, you know, stuff that kind of sticks with you and stays with you. Poor sleep wears on your body and it's chronic. It causes stress to happen throughout the day, changes hormone profiles. Um, it's just this chronic level of stress. And when you're, what your body tends to do under chronic stress is it tends to try to protect itself. And the way it protects itself is it says, hey, let's burn less calories. Got to keep it safe. We don't know what could happen. Food might not be here. Hey, let's store more body fat. Hey, let's lower these hormones that tend to speed up the metabolism, like testosterone and growth hormone. Let's raise these other hormones that'll help us store more body fat and kind of give us temporary energy, things like cortisol. And let's let's not have a faster metabolism. So good sleep is important because bad sleep will ruin everything that we just talked about. Yeah, I'm glad you added this one in the list um, because if there's ever somebody who I feel like is is doing all the things you're telling them and then they're still not seeing the results, this has been the culprit. Yes. Mm -hmm. If they're like, I'm doing this, I'm dieting, I'm training this, that. And we're like, we're both like scratching our head. Cause at this point, they haven't admitted to me, like, I have terrible sleep at night yeah. or I stress all night long or I have this terror. Like, that hadn't came up yet, right? We haven't, we're thinking about all the things we can, we can do about it. And this person's just piling more onto their already super stressful and non sleeping nights that I'm not aware of at this point yet. And this is normally when this comes out. It's like, are you sure you're doing this? You're doing that? You're doing this? You're doing that? And then it's normally like, well, then how's your sleeping? Oh, well, that's fucked up. Yeah. I don't, you know, then yeah. you're like, oh, okay. Well, there, yeah, there might be the problem. never fully recovered. Yeah. I mean, your body's just never in that place. I used to have, uh, clients this was like that one last piece that was actually turned out to be a massive piece in the whole puzzle like you know nutrition dialed like workouts are on point everything but was getting woken up many times in the middle of the night uh for for phone calls and things overseas and it's just like battling that and carrying that same stress all day long it just affected uh, a snowball effect to everything else yeah and it, i mean it affects behaviors too it affects cravings it affects your moods yep uh, it affects muscle building. Yeah, it makes all the, it makes the other things all harder. Not yeah. only does it not help them and potentially hurt, hinder them, from <laughs> it'll make them impossible. It'll make yeah. it impossible. Yeah. I had a guy. I had a client once that, like you were saying, Adam was doing everything right. Finally, we tackled his sleep when we when he really took sleep seriously, and we really got. And it took us a little while. It took us a few months to really figure this out. He did a sleep study and worked with a doctor, and we figured it out. He lost, I mean, ten pounds of body fat and gained ten pounds of muscle. It was crazy. We were doing all the same stuff. Yeah. The only difference was he finally got a sleep down and it made such, and we, and I remember he was going to this doctor. They were also looking at his hormone, like mm -hmm. everything changed yeah. just from sleep. So I had to include this because if this is off, you could strength train with the best programs. You could eat great protein. You could have the right cardio for health. You could feed your body appropriately, do all the right stuff. This is going to, it'll just. 
Yeah, hijackable. we cut the workouts in half uh, with with my client after we had realized that was the biggest culprit, and then you just focus on sleep, and it was like this completely transformative thing, just unlocked. You know, and I and I know it's sleep that we're pointing to right now, but I mean, I think that this could almost include like your your overall just stress bucket. Sure. Right. So maybe you get okay sleep, or it's not the worst sleep ever, and so you don't think that's a culprit, but then you have this like you know, crazy marriage, you you hate your boss, like you just got all this other stress going on in your life that a lot of times in, in my experience, when a, when a client is doing most, if not all the things you're telling them to do and their body still is not responding, a lot of times that is just, we are over, the body is just feeling attacked from it. You got to remember that even this working out and dieting stuff is a stress on the body. Well, yep. So if, if your bucket was already full when you came to me and then I added to it, even if it's things that are quote unquote healthy for you, right? Exercise, right? Eating better. It, it will sometimes completely stall your progress because your body is just is too overwhelmed and reducing and cutting back on a lot of things is actually the simplest thing. Well, think of it this way, right? If you, um, if you, if the economy looks like it's going terrible, what are people going to do? Save their money, not spend a lot, cut their bills, right? It's what your body does with calories. If it starts to feel lots of stress, it'll try to save calories, right? It'll try to store more of them and it'll reduce how many calories you put out. So it'll actually slow your metabolism down. In fact, losing sleep is one of the fastest way to slow your metabolism down. So it's a very important one. In in the context of now, if you would lose weight the wrong way, you may lose weight, but you will turn your body into a fat storing machine, which not only in the long term makes it very difficult, but even in the short term, it makes it very difficult. And here's the thing. If you think you're flabby, getting smaller means you might just get be a smaller flabby version of yourself. So fat burning machine looks very different than fat storing machine. Well, the truth is that this is actually really difficult to do. And I think marketers try and make it seem simple, right? To, mm -hmm. to advertise to you, oh, quick, do this in 30 days, or it's as easy as these three steps. Um, it, but it's not, it's actually really hard. And it's been, a, it was a, a struggle for most of my clients and for many reasons, and we're going to go over uh, many of those, right? We're going to get into nutrition, we'll get into stress management, we'll get into programming, all those things that I think need to be aligned really well to do this. But I think the number one thing before we even get into those is addressing the psychology of this. To me, that that was always, as a trainer, that was the hardest hurdle for me to overcome. Yeah. Is that clients, just like you said, Sal, they just want to get smaller. I just want to lose weight. I don't care, Adam. Just get that scale down. I don't like the fact that I'm seeing over 200 pounds. I've never seen that in my entire life. Get me below that. Get me below that. And so they've ingrained this in their in their head that, that that that's all they care about is the scale but the truth is if i'm doing a really good job as a coach if i have this beautiful balance of nutrition and strength training and cardio and stress management i really shouldn't see much of a fluctuation unless this person is like morbidly obese right if i have somebody who's 300 plus pounds we're going to come down on that scale. I mean, that scale is going to come down a lot when we get them to a very healthy place. But I'm talking about the average person who needs to lose 20 to 40 pounds. It's two. There's two different. There's two graphs. Imagine two graphs here. Okay, doing it the wrong way. What if it's if you're measuring weight? Forget body fat percentage for a second. We've already made the case. If you do it the right way, you lose more body fat. If you do it the wrong way, you will lose weight and less body fat. Okay. By the way. If you lose weight, if, if you lose 10 pounds, half of its muscle, your body fat percentage stays the same. Okay, people, don't, people don't realize that. So your body fat percentage is what determines how you look, obviously. So if you have a 100-pound person who's got 20% body fat, take that body fat, put it on a 200-pound person, it's 10% body fat. They look much leaner. So if you lose weight, half of its muscle, body fat percentage actually stayed the same. You're a smaller version of yourself, but you look... So really fluffy. Yeah, you look no different. But imagine these two graphs. If you do things the wrong way, initially you see quick weight loss, strong plateau. That's it. You're done. If you do things the wrong way, on the scale, forget the body fat percentage because that does come down uh, right out the gates if you do it right. But on the scale, the fat loss looks more like a uh, momentum builder. So it starts off slow, but then it starts to ramp up. As your body turns into this fat burning machine, then it really starts to come off. The, with the example that Adam talked about of, oh my gosh, I, I weigh over 200 pounds or whatever, initially we're not looking for weight on the scale because I'm le I'm getting you to lose body fat percentage while I'm building muscle. Eventually I can't build, I'm not going to build 30 pounds of muscle on somebody's body who needs to lose 
30 pounds of body fat. I'll build some muscle. Once we've hit that limit a little bit where the muscles come up, the metabolism's up, uh oh, now we're starting to plateau with muscle, which is totally normal. Then the fat really starts to come off. So rather than it being like initially quick and then plateauing, it starts off a little slower on the scale, but then it ramps up and it speeds off. And then if you look at it long term, it's far more permanent. Well, you have to explain why that is, right? You, Because the average person doesn't understand w how does that work? It doesn't make sense. How is someone eating more, building muscle, and their metabolism working faster? It, it, muscle is an expensive tissue. In other words, it it costs the body a lot of calories to keep it on your on your body. So just simply adding so take a person who is unhappy they they're 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 fat they want to lose body fat they're unhappy with their weight and you don't lose any fat on them at all and you just give them five more pounds of muscle you get them to add five more pounds of muscle you right away speed their metabolism up that's right you right away are gonna their body now requires x amount more calories and there's all kinds of places that, that people will debate on the exact amount of calories that it is but just for argument's sake let's just say five pounds somewhere between 200 and 300 more calories your body needs. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. you know? On its own. Yeah, just by itself, not doing anything. Yeah, because because here's the key with the turning your body into a fat-burning machine. What that means is you are literally turning, you are moving your body to a, a, a place where it burns more calories automatically. Okay, This is a superior position than burning calories manually. Manually means if I want to burn an extra... You know, Adam gave the example of gaining five pounds of muscle and burning, let's say, 300 more calories. Which, by the way, that's a pretty good generalization. In my experience, if somebody gained five pounds of muscle, they're going to burn, especially if they do it the right way. We're burning about 300 more calories a day on average. That's that's just average. Some people a little less, some people a little more. So if I'm sitting around and I want to burn 300 more calories a day, I can either get up and walk for an hour and a half or two hours or do cardio or... I can teach my body to burn more calories so I can stay seated yeah. and burn an additional 300 calories a day. Which one of those scenarios is easier to maintain? Right. Which of those scenarios is, is going to be more beneficial considering your life is both sedentary and the fact that there's, more, that there's all this food around you? Here's what you don't want to do. What you don't want to do is just cut your calories, lose muscle, now you're eating, I don't know, 1,500, 1,600 calories a day, and you got to your goal body weight. Guess what you got to do to stay there now? You got to keep it. You're still eating 1,500 yeah. calories a day. Yeah. Every how single how day. long do you want to live in that position? It's just not sustainable. That's one of those things I think people don't realize once you get to an end goal, you have to really assess what that looks like once you get there. Yes. You know, like once I got there, like, do am I happy doing this now from then on? Or is this something that I just wanted to temporarily get here? Yeah, but now you're just going to, you're putting all this pressure on your body to maintain, you know, that level of stress and that level of cardio and, and reducing my calories. I have to be able to keep doing that. Otherwise, I'm going to go right back up. I have, so I've, I've done this many, many, many times with clients. One of my favorite things to do is to take somebody and really turn their body into this fat burning machine. One client in particular sticks, stands out because she was such a hard working client. She came to me after competing in bikini competitions. So these are fitness bikini competitions, not like the you know Hawaiian Tropic old school one or whatever. So they're actually going on stage, getting shredded, trying to show some muscle and that, that kind of stuff. So she did that a few times, extreme dieting. On top of it, she did cardio a lot. We're talking about an hour or more every single day. This was either running or she was cycling every single day. She was lifting weights a couple days a week. She was kind of new to the whole lifting weights thing, so she didn't do a whole lot of resistance training. Her calories were very low. So here's the crazy part. All that exercise, all that, but because she had done this for so long, she got to the point where if she ate anything over, I think it was like 17 or 1800 calories, uh, she would gain body fat. And I remember she came to me and I give her tips and stuff like that. Finally, she hired me because she said, Sal, I can't, and she wasn't like highly competitive. These were just local shows. She goes, you know, I want to do better as a bikini competitor, but the judges are telling me I need more muscle and I need to get leaner. She goes, I can't get leaner. I can't eat less food and work out more. She's like, I've got kids. I'm already doing over an hour of cardio every day plus lifting weights. But, oh, she was also doing yoga and other stuff on top of it. She's like, "How? what, what do I do? Move more? Hmm. Eat less? She's like, I don't want to do that. And I said, no, that's insane. Let's not do that. I said, let's give you 
let's let's give six to eight months. Six to eight months because we've done some damage. You've really slowed your metabolism down, and we're going to reverse it a little bit. So here's what we did. We slowly reduced her cardiovascular activity, so I slowly moved her off the manual calorie burn. We increased the type of resistance training we did, focused mainly on building strength. I slowly increased her calories. We did some stress management. She had to do a lot of trust and faith in me. That was a big one. I remember it was literally every day a text between us where she'd be like, are you sure? I'm afraid. What's going to happen? Don't worry. Trust it. Anyway, at the end of that, uh, it was, I think it took us about eight months. At the end of that eight-month period, she was doing, I think, a couple days of cardio a week, which is like 30 minutes, which is nothing. Her and I were lifting weights three to four days a week. Traditional resistance training wasn't this crazy calorie burn type of stuff. And she was eating 800 more calories a day than she was before and leaner. And she was leaner on top of it. And now that's one example. I've done this so many times with other people. If you can turn your body into a fat burning machine, your odds of being successful and staying lean are so much, so much higher. Well, let's let's take that, okay, and let's break the the steps down, right? So you just gave a great example of, you know, how most people should uh, go after building a fat burning machine here. So and I think the very first thing that I like to address uh, before we get into the other steps, the first step for me is, is stress management. Uh, and mm -hmm. and that that's kind of changed over time. Like that wasn't a huge focus for me. I feel like when I first started as a trainer, I just feel like uh, stress and anxiety and uh, you know what, with tech now and how much we're seated and uh, people not not prioritizing sleep, I just feel like stress management has become more important today than it's ever become. And I think that that's the first place I like to look. I can start to make some real, real basic changes that can make a big difference on how their metabolism is working for them, right? So right away, I'm looking at like a, a prioritizing sleep. I want to I want to look at my clients' sleep and recovery and address stress management first and foremost. Yeah, and, and here's why it's important, by the way, why you want to manage stress. So we talked about how, you know, you can send signals to the body and it tries to get better at what it does a lot of. So let's say you have a lot of stress in your life, either from too much exercise, a hectic schedule, poor sleep, bad diet, you know, uh, just, just generally just too much stress, too much stress all the time. What this tells the body is it says, conserve calories and mm -hmm. eat more. These are the two things that it sends the body. Now, why does it do this? Historically, lots of stress uh, for humans meant I don't have shelter, don't have food. So the body says, slow down the calorie burn, everybody. Stressed out situation. We need to make, we need to make sure we store these calories because remember, for most of human history, food was very, very tough to come by. So you actually move away from being effective at burning body fat. You actually move towards being effective at storing body fat when stress is like this. They've actually shown studies where not only does it in increase the amount of fat someone will store, but it also it changes the way people store body fat to move it more toward the visceral body fat where it's in around the organs or around the belly. Um, stress management is a very, very big one. So this is an important thing because, again, if your stress is uh, either too much or not managed properly, now you're fighting against your body. It's going to be very hard to get lean when your body's afraid to get lean. Well, this was also, you know, to your point of like readjusting sort of the strategy. I thought that this had so much more weight because like going through and doing an inventory of stress, I think people just don't realize where it's all coming from a lot of times. And if you go through and you see your situation at work, you see, you know, even your interactions with your relationships or your family, uh, you know, you're moving, uh, like you're, you're just on the go constantly, you're traveling all the time, like all these things are potential stressors and that will affect your sleep too. So, you know, the, the recovery process gets interrupted and then you're just compiling this stress and carrying it with you. And it just, it, it becomes, it comes to a point where now your, your solution is to exercise which you know may have that temporary feeling of like oh i was able to relieve some of that stress but really at the end of the day we're adding more to it so it's really important to almost itemize all these things and see what you can start addressing oh 100 i i feel like uh the analogy that sal gave and justin failed to help him out with 
was is, is, <laughs> is what comes. I'm always to, trying to bring out my failures. Is, huh? is, 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 is what comes to mind right away for me, right? So I I envision this cartoon that you said of you know all these little guys that are are running inside of you that are deciding you know to pull all these levers to to burn body fat. Yeah. And what stress is? It's like these alarms going off for them. Like oh she's not feeding us calories. Oh she's running running on a treadmill. Oh she's not sleeping very well. Oh she's fighting with her husband. Oh it's like those are all alarms and they're they're and you're pulling all those at once. It doesn't know where to prioritize in it and it goes into like just survival no no look what do you okay think about it this way all right uh imagine okay let's just pretend money is like body fat right for us right so what happens when the economy gets really crazy things get really stressful out there what do people tend to do Mm. store money yeah oh honey listen we're not going out to dinner for a little while oh but we got but we got money in the bank account yeah but the economy is looking kind of scary i don't know if i'm going to keep my job Let's just store this money. I know we got money to, it's already saved, but let's not spend any. We don't know what the future is going to look like. It's right. really crazy. This is what these these this is what your body's doing when there's a lot of stress. It's saying, "Oh, things are looking bad. We're really stressed out. I know we got this body fat already that's stored energy, but let's just add more to it. Let's just add more. Let's try to slow down the metabolism. Stop burn as much." We, we don't know what the future holds. And usually, you know, again, historically, lots of stress meant we ran out of food. So let's just store as much body fat as possible. That's a great analogy because yeah. then the building muscle part is just adding more money to your bank. It, oh, That's what that is. Oh, oh, building mm-hmm. muscle is, is burning more money. Yeah. You mean burning more money, right? Yeah, like yeah. adding muscle is like, uh, imagine the economy goes, goes bad. And instead of saving your money, like, let's go buy a boat. You know, let's go buy like a, a you know a, a cash pit or whatever. That's what muscle is to your body. Muscle is expensive. It costs a lot of calories, and if you're stressed out, your body doesn't want muscle. It's not going to want any muscle. It just costs too much. It wants to stay safe. I remember the first time I had a client. This blew me away the first time it happened. Then every time after that, it was just became commonplace. But I remember the first time I had a client exercise or burn less calories through exercise and actually get leaner. Yeah. The fr- I remember the first time it happened. I had this. This uh, type A woman, she was an executive, insane uh, activity levels. She did all the Group X classes and running and you know hit you know classes and boot camps. And then mm-hmm. she came and hired me as a personal trainer. This is before I really understood this, by the way. And it was all about calorie balance, right? Energy balance for me. So I'm like, oh, you're burning this many calories. You're eating this many calories. You want to get leaner? We got to cut your calories even more. And then we got to cut your calories. Well, it got to a point where she's like, I don't want to eat any less. Why am I not getting leaner? You know, and I'm looking at her thing. I'm like, my God, you're working out like crazy. And so I remember I had this conversation with a with a, a veteran trainer, and they said, you know, I talked to him about it, like she's just too much. Bring it back down. I'm like, yeah, but then she's going to get fatter mm-hmm. if she stops doing all this 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 calorie burn. She's going to gain body fat. And, and 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 they said, no, no, no. Watch what happens. So I said, okay. So I convinced this client to swap out two of her hard workout days with uh, slow yoga classes. Like this was like Yin yoga style, where you're literally sitting in a stretch for 30 seconds. You're burning no calories, okay? Compared to what she was doing before, she's burning no calories. So we, I, we took her from classes that were probably burning five to 600 calories that were intense to classes that were burning like 100 calories. Mm-hmm. And I convinced her and I said, let's just, this will get your body to burn more body fat. So she does it. At first, nothing happened, which blew both of us away. I'm like, yeah. look, you gained no weight. This is so far so good. You haven't gained more weight. And then magically- her body got leaner. And I remember we were both like shocked at it. And she was like, this is crazy. I'm yeah. like, well, you're, you're telling your body it's okay to burn more body fat because we're balancing out your stress. It was the same with me. I had a clear example of that, of a, you know, a VP of a massive company that every night would worry that there'd be some kind of fire that she needed to put out around the world somewhere. Like there would be a call. You have to just wake up and answer the call. And just that alone, uh, was something that just that interruption, it was like we were always in this hamster wheel, just trying to spin just to keep whatever weight that we could uh, sustainable. And once, once the you know, barriers were set up to where that wasn't the case, like the, the she could actually sleep through the night, it was like an immediate loss of like 10 pounds of good weight, you know, just off. That's and crazy, and just, the, just the body's innate tendency to just hold on to that you know cause like you said like it's just it's survival it's something that your body you know wants to to help you with oh, so an easy takeaway i think we should you know the first thing that i would tell client is to you know prioritize sleep right because i think that's the, the number one that's the biggest one right like just 
just simply putting uh, and he's like talking about Justin's client, like you know that that type of client is also the client that keeps their phone right by their bed, and mm-hmm. so then at one o'clock when it goes off, they reach to it and they can't help but look. Like you know, if you're that person, this this matters the most, right? Like get right. the phone out of the room, get the room dark. Sal talks all up, turning the lights off when you get when the sun goes down. If you got blue blockers, if you got there's lots of great tools to help assist this. But at the bottom line, even if you don't have any of these tools, just prioritize sleep. Just make it a priority to pay attention to how you get ready for bed the same way that you get up. Actually, from bed. if there's any if there's the one thing that you can do that will do the have the greatest impact on there's a lot of things you can do for stress. You can meditate you could exercise appropriately. Yeah, breathing good for some, techniques. You know, breathing techniques. You can, you know, work on your relationships with the people around you. There's a lot of things you could do. But the single most impactful thing, if you just want to do one thing, is prioritize sleep. Just do that. That's it. Every night, get seven to nine hours of quality sleep. Go to bed at the same time. Wake up the same time every mo- in the morning. Just do that by itself. And that by itself has the biggest impact uh, for stress. Uh, the second thing um, that we should focus on is uh, building muscle. This is your fat burning engine. This is the engine. Think about it this way. This is the engine that's always on. It's always burning calories. And then when you move, it's really revving up and burning a lot of calories. If you if you make the cornerstone of your workouts towards building muscle, you will the odds that you'll build a fat burning machine are, are much higher. In fact, whether you want to build muscle like a bodybuilder and get big arms and whatever, or you just want to get as lean as possible, just want to lose body fat, both those people should train similarly. You should be training to build muscle. This was always a great conversation with clients because when they came to me for losing weight, I'd basically talk them into, no, well, we're going to train like we're trying to build muscle. I don't want to gain muscle. I'm trying to lose weight. It's like, okay, and I have this conversation, but that's the way you should train. Lift weights like you're trying to build muscle and get stronger. Don't lift weights like you're just trying to sweat and burn as many calories as possible. Now, that being said, remember too, and I like following this after talking about stress first because some people just hear that and they go, okay, weights every day. I'm going to train hard every single day, try and build muscle, try and build strength five days, seven days a week. Remember, that too is a stress. That also is sending those those guys running around in your body, those alarms going off mm-hmm. and pulling levers. you got to think you want to have a nice balance. So that's why you, I, I love the analogy that you guys gave both with clients of reducing their training actually resulted in more body fat. You don't need to be training every single day inside the gym. Two to three days a week of good strength building okay, or focusing on building muscle is plenty. So maybe you're going to the gym four or five times, but those other two times are mobility work or yoga yeah. or working inward because that's also helping the stress management side in addition to you also focusing on recovery and building muscle. Yeah, I would say the two best programs in this category for building muscle for the average person, one would be is ideal for a beginner. That's MAP Starter. So that'll get you building some good muscle. The other one is ideal for someone who has some experience working out in the gym, and that's MAPS Anabolic. Both those programs are very effective at building muscle and boosting the metabolism, which is a side effect. This is the wonderful thing about building a a fat-burning machine uh, for a body is that the side effect of that is natural fat loss, which is really, really cool. I mean, your, 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 your body wants to burn body fat, makes things uh, a, a whole lot easier. Now, there's a couple components to both those programs. Actually, there's a couple components that should be in all muscle building programs. Uh, number one, strength is your greatest uh, objective measure as to whether or not it's working. Okay, So if you're in the gym and you're getting stronger, you added a rep to your squat, you added five pounds to your overhead press, you're able to do a little bit more with your curls. That is the best objective measure that's telling you you're moving in the right direction. In mm. fact, that's that's the best measure. Now it's all it's not a hundred percent because you can change technique and all that stuff to to get stronger. But if you have good form, good control, and you're getting stronger, you can essentially guarantee yourself that you're moving in the right direction of building muscle and boosting your metabolism. Well, it's a way better measure than us watching the scale. Oh, way better. Right. Oh, yeah. So when so and this is when I gave the first, you know, analogy uh, uh, the visual of the the line and the spectrum. This is where I want to be with a client. I want to be right in the middle where we're not seeing much fluctuation on the scale, but we're getting stronger. If that's the case, I'm letting him or her know, like, we're winning right mm-hmm. now. We are doing a beautiful exchange. You're getting stronger in the gym. Your scale isn't going down, which tells me we're probably 
adding some muscle on your body and you're also probably leaning out and that's why we're hovering around the same weight. Yeah, right. and back to your your point of like the, the dose matters, right? So that's that's something to consider too, whether or not like and your strength will kind of indicate uh, whether or not you might be a, a little bit overdoing it or, you know, underdoing it. And so that's something to always keep in mind uh, while adding the, the proper amount of recovery. But, uh, you know, there's a way to do it where it, it's not always more is better. And I think that's the, the message that everybody's always heard about burning body fat is like, you know, you can't do enough. And, you know, that's just not true once you do an inventory of all the stress you're already accumulating. No, look at your strength. You know, look, MAPS Anabolic, which I said was for people who have some experience. You can do that program two days a week, two days a week, but it's effective, right? You're in there, you're doing the compound movements, you're phasing your reps. There's different cycles in the program, but it's two days a week. And if you're getting stronger, okay, here's the thing. This is the, this is the big challenge. People will get stronger and they think that they'll get stronger faster if they add more. Right. When you're getting stronger, that's you're doing it. Yeah. Leave it alone. Yeah. yeah. It's you're, working. You're doing a good job. Don't mess with it. If you're not getting stronger and you're working out, you know, four days a week, believe it or not, for a lot of people, reduce a day. If you're working out one day a week and you're not getting stronger, sometimes that means adding uh, an extra day. But that's what we mean by balance. You want to find the balance that improves that strength. And when you're getting stronger, you can pretty much guarantee... Hey, sorry to interrupt. We have a free guide titled Understanding Your Mood, Stress, and Sleep. It tackles all of those things from a health and longevity perspective. It's a totally, totally free guide. So just click on the link at the top of the description below. You're boosting your body's ability to burn body fat uh, automatically. Now, the next one, this is one that people jump to automatically. Uh, when way, they're trying too, to, way too soon. Way too soon. This mm -hmm. is cardio. This is all the categories of cardio. Now, cardiovascular activity definitely has some performance benefits. So if you're somebody that wants to build uh, endurance and stamina, you want to get good at cycling, mm -hmm. good at swimming, good at running, then that m makes pl plenty of sense to make cardiovascular training the cornerstone of your routine. But if your goal is to build a fat burning machine, cardiovascular activity should play not the starting role, it should be a supporting role. The cornerstone is resistance training because that directly speeds up the metabolism. Cardio does not directly speed up the metabolism. So cardio should be as a supportive role. Now when we look at cardio, we want to consider quite a few different things. Which one's going to be the most effective at burning calories? Cardio is a man manual calorie burn. But here's a second one. This one's actually more important. Which style and form of cardiovascular activity is going to be most easiest for me to maintain forever? Mm. Okay. For most people, this does not look like structured 30 minutes of cardio X amount days a week. You already got your structured resistance training because that's the cornerstone. So let's say you're doing two or three days a week of structured resistance training. There's your there's your scheduled workouts. You want to add an additional two or three structured workouts to your schedule or an additional 30 minutes to those workouts. It's going to make it much more difficult to stick to. Yeah. Here's my favorite way to add cardiovascular activity to increase the manual calorie burn. Build it into your life. <coughs> make it something that works around your current behaviors. Here's an easy way to do it and it works very very well for a lot of people. Add a 10-minute walk after every meal. That's it. 10-minute mm -hmm. walk after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You're already eating those meals anyway. You're already having breakfast. You're already having lunch. You're already having dinner. It feels good to walk for 10 minutes. 10 minutes is a very small commitment. It's nothing. It's easy to get up after eating lunch and be like, I'm going to go for a stroll around the block for 10 minutes. But you add up all those 10-minute walks, and what do you have? 30 minutes of cardio every single day. Yeah. You have increased activity, increased calorie burn, just from the 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 you know adding it to behaviors that you already have. I love that so much. I love uh, focusing more on you, you know activities that uh, promote productivity as well. So things around your house that you know I've been w waiting to get to it. And it, the, the thing about these pursuits about like I want to get into fitness. I want to burn body fat. I want to do all these things in this direction. Why not incorporate that around things too that help, uh, you know, uh, your everyday lifestyle, like things that, uh, like if just cleaning my house or like yeah. doing things around outside that need trimming or, uh, you know, going uh, and taking the dogs for more walks and, and things like that, that are just very reasonable and things that benefit everything else around you. Like I just, it, it's so much more of a lifestyle way to approach it that I feel has more sustainability. That's the, 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 here's the thing about cardio that's awesome is that it has no form 
unless you're training specifically for a sport, like I said earlier, swimming, cycling, running, cardio is just from this standpoint from fit, from burning fat uh, with a cornerstone of resistance training to boost your metabolism. Cardio is just calorie burn. So in other words, anything that is movement Doesn't can be considered cardio. Like. So what Justin's saying is absolutely brilliant. It's literally I might as well rake the leaves. I might as well clean the kitchen. I might as well stand and fold clothes yeah. uh, while I watch TV. That is also uh, manual calorie burn. And in fact, it, it, back to Justin's point, it's a much easier way of staying consistent. Not only that, you have to address the the adaptation process when it comes to cardio too. The body adapts to that very fast. Mm -hmm. So not only is it just a manual calorie burn, it's a, mal a manual calorie burn that gets less and less each time you do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe the first time you got on that treadmill and you got after it, you know, for a half hour, hour, you burned X amount of calories. The next time it burns a little less, the next time a little less, and the next time a little less. Before or eventually what ends up happening is your body gets so adapted to it, it burns very, very little calories. So I like to, like Justin saying, make it more into lifestyle or what Sal's saying, adding it to, you know, adding walking to after your meals, something that is sustainable forever that you're never going to stop doing. And then using cardio as a tool because I've got something in a week or two. I've got, I've you know, I've been doing this. I've been training with Adam for the last year or two. And, oh, I've got this bachelor party or I've got this Vegas trip or I've got this thing I'm going to be on the beach in two or three weeks. And, hey, you know what? I want to turn it up a little bit right before I go out in a bikini or whatever. And so if that, that's a great time to pull this cardio card out because then – when you do it, your body will really respond because your body's not used to doing it all the time, and it'll give you some great results for a couple weeks. But if you go to this as your main method of burning fat right out the gates, you'll see an initial fall. You'll see initial redu reduction in body fat. Then the body gets adapted it, to it, and then where do you go from there? That's why it's like the last place I want to go. It is. Now, you can choose a couple different forms of structured cardio. You have your, your ready, you know, your kind of steady state, traditional form of cardio. This is hiking or cycling or long distance running and that kind of stuff. Um, the benefits of that is it builds endurance and it doesn't require as much skill and control typically, right? Then you have your hit forms of cardio where you're training far higher intensity for short, short periods pounds. of time. <laughs> the benefit of that is it doesn't take as much time, burns almost as many calories in a shorter period of time. The detriments it requires more skill because you're going so much harder. In fact, if you want to do short-term HIIT training, uh, one of the best ways to do it is with weights uh, because you're less likely to lose muscle doing it that way. Don't recommend doing it for long periods of time, right. uh, but if you did it for like a month, you could see, you could see like a, a short-term fat loss uh, you know, start to happen. We have a program called MAPS HIIT um, that actually does that, and if you follow that for short periods of time, you'll see those short bouts of fat loss, but long-term... Um, if you want to have a good, just kind of fat burning lifestyle with the fast metabolism, the most effective way to implement cardio is to implement it in your life and not have it be structured and just to be active uh, throughout the day naturally. Now, the last thing we should definitely talk about is nutrition. And this is important because although you do speed up your metabolism, although you get your body to burn more calories, um, it's always easier to eat calories than it is to burn them. Yeah. It always is. I mean, if you speed up your metabolism to burn 800 more calories a day, which is awesome, that's a lot of calories uh, that you can burn naturally uh, every single day, it's still pretty easy to eat 800 calories. I could do that in about 15 minutes. I could minutes. drink that. Yeah. yeah <laughs> no problem. So you have to pay attention to nutrition if you want fat loss. If you didn't pay attention to nutrition, you'd still get the strength and the health benefits, but the fat loss would be very, very difficult. So nutrition is just... It's something you need to look at. Number one, this is something you can't get around. You have to eat less calories than you're burning to cause fat loss. But there are some strategies that make that very easy. Rather than counting calories, which is fine, you can do that. You want to count calories, that's one way to do it. But here's another way that you could do it that seems to just have the side effect be, I eat less. Eat mostly whole foods. Avoid heavily processed foods. Naturally, people tend to eat about five to 600 calories less a day when they stick to whole natural foods. And with that, you don't have to necessarily restrict yourself. You're just eliminating heavily processed foods. Naturally, what you see is a reduction in calories. I'm going to go on a limb and say you don't have to restrict at all. That's a, If you have somebody who is eating heavily processed foods, they, they are overweight, and the first thing I'm going to do is I, I'm going to switch them off of processed foods to eating just whole foods, but I'm not going to limit them at all. 
If you tell me you're hungry, I want I want to feed you because even if you do overconsume a little bit, if we're doing a good job of stress management and strength training, those extra calories should get partitioned into building it's muscle. Use it. yeah. yeah, you're going to end up using it, and I'd much rather take you there when we're first starting off on our fat loss journey, then to also reduce calories. I think of it very similar as cardio. Cardio, I say, is the last thing that I pull pull out to really speed up the fat loss process. So is reducing calories. That's the second to last thing. Before I start cutting calories and restricting you hard, I'd much rather just say, hey, listen, let's just get rid of the processed foods, but I'm not going to tell you you can't eat. If you're hungry, go eat. Just choose from these whole foods. And then what I know as a trainer and coach is, you know what? They might eat the same amount of calories. They might even eat a little bit more than what they were eating before. But if they switch over to whole foods, it's going to be really tough for them to eat a lot more calories and what they were doing with processed foods. And even if they do, the little bit of those extra calories more likely are going to get pro partitioned over into building yeah, muscle. In my, in my experience, when they avoid heavily processed foods, they just they lose body fat because they eat less. Um, and studies show it's about five to 600 uh, calories consistently. Consistently, naturally. I like it because it's natural. You know what I'm saying? Mm. It's not like I'm sitting there counting everything I'm eating and, oh my gosh, this is stressful. I'm literally just saying to myself, I'm going to stick to these whole natural foods and eat when I'm hungry. And then the side effect of that is I'm eating less and not even realizing it. And this makes the the fat loss much more sustainable. Well, a lot of these processed foods, they trick that that feeling of satiety. So like you, you don't really, uh, you're not really re uh, responsive to that anymore to where like when you jump over to whole foods, it's like, I feel s satisfied. I feel sustained. I feel like I'm full again. And that's just something that, again, that's that feeds into a reduction in calories. You just don't, your body doesn't feel like it needs to keep uh, going. Now, there, there is one macronutrient that I, I will track or I will ask them to track, and that's pro protein. Yes. Uh, and that's mainly because most people that were in this category of trying to lose body fat were grossly under eating. They were overeating probably carbohydrates and processed foods, sugars, things like that. And they were under consuming protein. And plus, I like the, psycholo the, the psychology of that, right? I'm telling a client, listen, I'm not going to tell you, no, you can't eat anything. In fact, not only am I going to allow you to eat, eat as much as you want, as long as you're hungry and it's whole foods, I'm also going to tell you, make sure you get enough protein, make sure we're targeting that. So that's the main focus. The main focus is, okay, eat when you're hungry, whole foods, but then also target your number for protein. Go after that each meal. So every time I prepare a whole a whole food meal, I'm looking at the protein that's in it, and I want to try and get my mm -hmm. protein in my daily protein intake yeah, every day. Think of protein, and I hate to say this because this sounds so uh, like uh, you know marketing and you know uh, clickbaity. Um, so I'll clarify. But protein is your fat burning uh, macronutrient. Okay, let me explain. Okay, not that you'll take protein and magically it burns body fat, but here's what I mean by that, protein most strongly contributes to muscle gain. So when you're eating your uh, high-protein diet, this is proven beyond a shadow of a doubt, you build more muscle. Building more muscle speeds up the metabolism further, making fat loss easier. So that's number one. Number two, protein is uh, produces the most satiety. So when they do studies on proteins, fats, and carbs, which one fills you up the most, which one prevents you from overeating the most, Protein always wins. It produces the most satiety. So when people eat a high-protein diet, it also encourages them to eat less. So that's great. And then number three, protein also costs the most calories to utilize. So your body actually burns energy using energy. It has to process it. And protein is more thermogenic, that's the word that's used, than fats and carbs. So here's the three reasons why protein is the fat-burning macronutrient. Builds muscle, thus speeding up the metabolism. It makes you eat less because it produces the most satiety, and it's the most thermogenic. So you definitely want to hit your protein targets. So if you hit your protein targets and you aim for all whole foods, you should naturally eat in a way, and this is for most people, in my experience, most people this happens, you will eat in a way that naturally produces fat loss. And then if you combine it with a good strength training metabolism boosting routine like MAPS starter if you're a beginner or MAPS anabolic if you have some experience. You do the extra activity throughout the day. No, next, not, You don't need to do any structured cardio necessarily unless you want to burn some extra body fat in a short period of time, just like a week or two. But otherwise, just be more active, manage your stress. Mainly by getting good sleep, you will turn your body into a much more effective 
fat burning machine. I actually really like uh, this tip, right? Because uh, and a couple things. One, um, you know, you you see sometimes these power lifters that have these big bellies, and people are like, "Oh, po power lifters aren't healthy. Look at their big old beer guts that they have and stuff like that." Yeah. Um, and then you also have you know people that. Uh, are that carry extra body fat on them just genetically seem to be have a higher body fat percentage, but then can do really athletic things. Mm -hmm. And so there, it, it's not as simple as like, oh, just because you look ripped or you looked fit that you're fit and healthy, you can actually carry a higher body fat percentage and still be yeah. much healthier than the what we would call back in the days the skinny fat person. Yeah. So mm -hmm. okay. So um, when I was doing research for uh, the resistance training revolution, I was blown away by how protective muscle by itself was. Mm -hmm. Like they have studies on obese individuals who lost no weight during the study. All they did was gain a little bit of muscle. And you saw significant improvements in things like insulin uh, sensitivity because muscle so metabolically active, it tends to balance out hormones. It improves insulin sensitivity. It Muscle is anti-inflammatory in, in the body. Now, yes, body fat itself by itself is also a risk factor, but muscle so protective that, and of course, we're not talking the extremes. Like you brought up the example of power lifters. So people are like, oh, but power lifters is that like, of course, there's extremes with sports. So like power lifters tend to be on the extreme end as well. Right. I'm talking generally speaking, if you had two, in, if you had two twins and one person had very little muscle, but was also skinny, the other person had a lot of muscle, but had higher than what would be considered normal body fat. The person with more muscle will probably be healthier. First of all, muscles mobile. It improves mobility. It, it decreases inflammation, improves insulin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Like r little muscle, it, it is very unhealthy on the body. It just is. It causes lots of problems. The most unhealthy population are people with little muscle and lots of body fat. That's when it gets real bad. So what's my point with this is, you know, working out, getting fit and getting strong, even if you don't get leaner, although that contributes to getting leaner, you have significantly improved your health just because you built some muscle. Well, this also like coincides and goes right along with like our recommended advice. A lot of times in, in seeking yeah. muscle building as you're before, even you're trying to lose weight. So yeah. you're trying to actually like physically change your composition by adding more muscle uh, to your body, which is more protective, have all those qualities you had mentioned. Uh, but then long-term is a better strategy on top of that for then getting leaner. Way better. better strategy. I mean, you, when you also go to, you, you're also not including the things that could uh, adversely happen if you all of a sudden cut calories yeah. and boost activity. So, you know, it's crazy because I think I started doing that well before I fully understood the science behind it. I just, it, through practice, I just realized mm -hmm. it. I was like, wow, that this seems to be a better strategy when mm -hmm. I focus my clients on adding healthy foods, getting strong and lifting weights and not being concerned about the scale, even when they come in and say, Adam, I need to lose a yeah. hundred pounds. Yeah. So I, I think this I just the same validates thing. that. I did the yeah. same thing, but it was for different reasons. Um, so it's kind of like I stumbled upon it. I did it because when a client came to see me two or three days a week, I knew I could at least train them right. The diet part was always hard because I'm not around when you're eating you know, seven days a week. So I always, I would right. always tackle the weight loss later. Mm -hmm. Now I would always say, hey, look, at least you're here now. I'm going to train you. Let's just focus on getting you stronger. Let's get, let's build some discipline and consistency there. And then we can look at diet. And little did I know that that was actually the best approach anyway. Cause of course, more muscle speeds up the metabolism, improves your hormone profile, improves insulin sensitivity. It makes the weight loss easier. It makes the fat loss easier. I should say and so much, much more, more of a catalyst for all those other like beneficial yeah. effects. But, but mobility is a big one. People don't, don't understand this. Like, especially as you age, muscle is what makes you mobile. It's what yeah. makes your body able to move. And as you get older, look, there's a, there's, there's older, there's a lot of elderly people who are skinny and have terrible mobility because they have no strength and no balance. Their health is not good at all. Uh, versus someone who's older who might be a little overweight. Of course, I'm, there's extremes here. So someone watching is like, well, yeah, if you're 500 pounds with muscle, that's not good. Like, okay, relax, everybody. I'm not talking about the extremes and speaking generally, but if you're, if you're, let's say, 20 pounds overweight, but you have muscle and mobility, you can move, you're strong, of course you're going to be healthier. By the way, the blood markers uh, and, the, and the tests you'll get at the doctor will show this. If you take somebody and you get them just to build little muscle, um, you'll see these improvements. Uh, in, in, typically, more improvements with a little bit of muscle gain than you will with a little more fat loss. Mm -hmm. So it's just something that nobody talks about um, that needs to be uh, discussed.
Okay, so I'm super curious. We, you know, when we get in here, we have the, I look up at the TV screen, I can see the notes that each of us have put up there for Doug. And a lot of times, like, I'll read and see, you know, like, oh, okay, I know that's Justin or I know where that's coming from. Sal, a lot of times, handles the partnerships and sponsors that we have. And so I'll see like a, a, a snippet and I'll be like, oh, I know where Sal's going. Okay. You've got Ned as fat loss. Like I'm so, in, I'm so, <laughs> Wait a yeah, I'm so intrigued by where you're going with this, bro. There's this. <laughs> we've talked about this before. There's this really weird paradoxical thing that they keep finding in studies. So they find that people that consume or use marijuana on a on a semi regular basis. Uh, consistently in the, in the studies that they do have lower BMIs, which is or leaner, which is hmm. ironic if you're a, 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 a weed smoker, like right. I have been and you get the munchies and stuff. That's so why it's paradoxical. That's why it's so crazy. Like yes. you would think that it would be the opposite. Anybody who's, and, and that's one of the ways that I actually mitigate, well, like uh, weight gain or body fat is like, I reduce my weed consumption at night or post dinner because I know that mm -hmm. that causes me to eat and munch. So, and I've, I'm, familiar with a lot of these studies. I've always thought that's so weird. So so people are like, this is crazy. No, no, no. First of all, again, the studies are consistent on this. Animal studies show this. There's human studies that show this as well. Uh, it's paradoxical again, because everybody knows that weed or cannabis is supposed to make you eat more. And, associate with the and be lazy. And be lazy. <laughs> right? Want to move less. Like what the hell is going on? Eat the, onions and sit on the couch. Okay. <laughs> this is how, this is how uh, interesting the, the, the data is. Pharmaceutical companies right now, right now, there are several pharmaceutical companies that have drugs in their pipeline, their development pipeline that are cannabinoid based. Okay. So cannabinoids are the class of molecules that THC falls under, CBD falls under, all the cannabinoids found in the hemp plant or the marijuana plant fall under. There are currently drugs, like I said, there's several pharmaceutical companies right now who are researching cannabinoid based drugs for weight loss and diabetes. Oh, wow. Because- wow. They see the effects. Cannabinoids seem to, mm. in many cases, improve insulin sensitivity. And the CB1 receptor, which is one of the cannabinoid receptors, so there's two, two of them that we know of, the CB1 receptor affects metabolism. And the data is showing that it may speed up metabolism. In other words, activating this receptor may actually teach your body to burn more calories. So, and again, pharmaceutical companies don't pursue something Unless it's because, I mean, you know how much money it costs to take a drug from conception to market? It's like a billion dollars. They don't pursue just anything. They don't They do not do that. Uh, but they are because it's really weird. So Ned and, and, and weight loss, obviously, is kind of tongue-in-cheek because Ned is a hemp oil product that's got full-spectrum cannabinoids. It, it, the data is very clear on things like inflammation, euphoria, sleep. Those are things we know it works. But it is very interesting and the reason why I'm bringing it up is I th we're probably going to see weight at some point in the future weight loss type products that are cannabinoid based because again these studies keep coming out. So you said it's the CB1 CB1. So that's the main one they attribute it like most of the fat loss to. They think because it does affect metabolism okay. and activating it seems to speed up the metabolism. But the insulin sen sensitivity one um, is a big one. I know when I invested years ago so this company doesn't exist anymore. It got bought up. But GW, I think we're called GW Pharmaceuticals. G uh -huh. um, they they are the ones they they had a drug that was fast tracked for a form of epilepsy. That's what got them known. Yeah, uh, Dravet syndrome, I think it was called. Um, this is when Charlotte's Web, that strain of uh, high CBD cannabis, became popular, right. and it was grown in Colorado a lot. So yeah, I was going to ask because of like the the ratios and all that. Like, have they figured out you know the pairings of that? Because there's also like CBC, CBN, yep. and yep. there's other like variations. So THC has its own benefits, but it's the least. It's the one that's least likely to be used in medicine because of its uh, psychotropic effects. Right. Yeah. So. Like, you know, you want to take something for inflammation. You don't want to be high all the time. I mean, maybe you do, but most people don't. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's some benefits to the psych psychotropic effects. There could be maybe some therapeutic effects and stuff like that. But they want to find the ones that affect you that have subtle, you know, maybe, maybe just make you feel better, but really have effects on inflammation, insulin sensitivity, anti-cancer. They're anti-proliferative with cancer. Cannabinoids have been shown. The first study, uh, I remember out of Spain, showed that it was anti-cancer in brain cancer. They showed it to be anti-cancer in liver cancer hmm. and other forms of cancer. So it's really interesting, but uh, with weight and fat loss and insulin sensitivity, 
there's they're, they're pursuing it. They're looking at it. And again, this the data keeps coming out. And it's weird because hmm. I remember when the first one came out, they thought, oh, something's wrong. Like this is this doesn't make sense. Like why are pot smokers have lower BMI? Then they did another one. Uh oh, it's showing up again. Animal st studies are showing it. This doesn't. That's why it's paradoxical because they totally anticipated right. them to all yeah, be heavier. The stigma that's running. Now I want to be clear. I don't. I think we all think that the the science and the research around this is fascinating, fun to talk about. I don't think that you would recommend no. this as a as a fat, as a fat burner. Although no. it may come out this way, yeah. right yeah. now, because more and more things now are moving in this direction, and maybe it's not the best fat loss type of su supplement, but we're starting to attach it to health benefits yeah. in general. Yeah. Do you foresee this as like a you know, potential, you know, <sighs> multivitamin stack of like becoming more of a daily usage thing that somebody takes at a, on a lower daily dose. I think mm -hmm. it'll, it, I don't know if it'll go that far to where they give it to everybody, but I think it'll be very commonly used because, the, you know, the uh, endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome hasn't been identified, but it's been speculated that a lot of people aren't producing enough of their own natural endocannabinoids uh, because of stress because of gut issues, because of uh, maybe you toxins. Know, or toxins. And, and so when you produce less of your own endocannabinoids, well, the effects may be more inflammation, gut issues. Uh, you may have issues with sleep. You may have issues with anxiety and mood. Um, and so supplementing with like hemp oil, which isn't going to get you high. You'll notice it, by the way. If you supplement with, if you take Ned, you'll feel it. You'll feel yeah. something. But you're not high. It's not like you smoke. It's a, a relaxed sort of calming. Yeah, you just be like, wow, I kind of feel good. And you can tell. It's not like a like, do I feel something? Like you can you can tell you feel something. I think a, a lot of people who have like kind of just just don't feel kind of good. They have inflammation. Their sleep is kind of crappy. Like this is it's uh, it's effective for a lot of people. I have family members. Okay, my dad, my mom. I have an aunt. My grandfather before he passed away, they were using Ned on a consistent basis. I get texts from my dad all the time. I'm running low. You know, and he always, he always offers to buy it, but of course I'm not going to make my dad buy it. I'm like, no, I'll give you some, but he uses it on a consistent basis. My dad's got, um, you know, he's got lots of arthritis and, and joint issues just from hard labor working since he was a child. I just went through a phase of, uh, training a little bit like a maniac. I had a ton of free time on my hands. I just finished PT school, passed my board exam and started up my own first job as a physical therapist yesterday, actually. Congrats. And, um. Yeah, thank you. And so in that downtime, I kind of took it as an opportunity to really push myself. I had all the free time in the world right before I'm about to have none of the free time in the world. Um, and I'm worried that I had great results, um, progressed towards all my goals, but I'm worried that I got myself in the trap of doing that with a lot of increased volume and intensity. And if you guys have any tips for ways to not regress now that I'm going to have to pull back on the amount of time that I'm spending in the gym and focused on my fitness goals. Yeah. Well, so there's a myth, uh, that I believe for a long time in, when it comes to fitness and it goes something like this, like whatever you do to get in shape, you have to keep doing to stay in shape. That's actually right. false. It's actually false. The amount of, of volume and intensity and frequency that someone is, uh, may need to build muscle or progress is much more than the amount that that person would need to do to maintain. So you could probably cut, and, and this is the data supports this, okay? Data you, supports one-seventh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could go way down. You could cut your volume in half, and you're not going to lose anything. Yeah. You might lose a little bit of stamina and endurance, because uh, that that might suffer from the reduced volume. But in terms of strength, muscle, how you look, you're not going to lose anything. If, if anything, knowing what I know about fitness fanatics, knowing what I know about human behavior, you may actually progress by cutting your volume down uh, in half, um, all things being equal. So I wouldn't worry about it. I would just follow a program that has less volume, less training, one that fits your schedule. Um, and then that's it. I, I, and you're probably going to be, not only are you going to be fine, you might actually do better. Ideally, yeah. knowing what you're about to head into, because I do know how rigorous the, the schedule can be for a PT, uh, I'd have MAPS Anabolic and MAPS 15 in my arsenal. And I think scaling back to MAPS Anabolic uh, is going to do a body good, probably feel good. But if it gets to a point where even three full hour workouts in a gym becomes too hectic for you or too much on your crazy schedule, 
then MAPS 15 is a, is a great default to that. Or toggling back and forth between when you have crazy loads, you kind of do more of a MAPS 15 type of routine. When you have weeks or stretches, when you have less of a load, you can get after a MAPS anabolic. But I think having those two at your disposal will probably be two of the best programs to have in your arsenal. If you don't have those already, do you have those? I have uh, anabolic, but not 15. All right. We'll hook you up yeah. with 15. So you got 15 now yeah. too. What is your, okay. what is your workout schedule look like now? And what do you think it's going to look like in terms of time? So I can, what it did look like right at the end is I really ramped up at the most I could equate it to would almost be like peaking for a bodybuilding show, which I wasn't doing, but it was like that kind of level of spending time. I was spending a few hours in the gym uh, getting home, making myself some food, walking after I ate, doing some chores around the house, try to keep moving, eat again, and then walk again. And that was pretty much my day. So there wasn't a whole lot of anything else going on, but I had nothing else going on. Now, um, my schedule with physical therapy, I'll be doing two 10 to 8 shifts and two 7 to 3 shifts. So I'm trying to figure out if I'll do mornings on some days, evenings on other days, or maybe take some rest during the week and pick up the weekend days instead. Map, you're, you're fine. Map's yeah. anabolic. You know what? I, if you didn't tell me anything about your new schedule, I would still tell you to do Map's anabolic because what you were doing before yeah. was probably too much. You got away with it because you recovered, but I bet going back to Map's anabolic, you're probably going to see progress. You're probably going to build muscle and strength. So I would right, do that. Absolutely. That's that's three days a week. That's three days a week in the gym. Yeah. Yeah. And as I mentioned in, in my question, um, what I did before was intended only to be a very short-term push and then get away from it. I would never do that uh, long-term. I did have one thing to add. You know, I've heard you guys talk about how you don't need to train as much to maintain strength and muscle. The specific um, backslide I was worried about is actually putting on body fat because I got myself used to staying lean through using a ton of movement, which I know is a trap. And now I'm worried about, um, you know, continuing to hit protein, but dropping my calories so that I don't lose the muscle, which I know I can keep, but not being in a calorie surplus when my activity is so much lower. Do you know how much you were, do you know how much you were hitting uh, calorie wise during this time of like super high activity? Where are you at? Based on the times that I've tracked before, I was probably around 200 grams of protein and probably 3000 calories or so. And I was, I was building strength and dropping fat in that time. You know, it'll probably happen <clears throat> is I would say, don't change your diet yeah. yet. I would go yeah. maps anabolic on your days off. Just keep track, you know, try to pay attention to how much you walk. So maybe do a few walks a day, you know, 15 minute walks. And what'll probably happen is it'll probably feel more muscle growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't think you're, I don't think you're too high a calorie. I, no. I would have said if you were like 4,000, I'd say, oh, I just drop your calories, five to 600 calories while you're, but at 3000 calories and you were getting leaner and building muscle. Yeah. You're probably, you're probably yeah. going to just build more. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was in a cut intentionally. Okay. Oh, yeah. it was, yeah. I would keep it the same then. Yeah. I, I wouldn't change okay. it. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're going to be fine. Yeah. I think you're going to okay. be just fine, man. All right. Well, thank you guys. Oh, can I have a, put in a quick question about bands? Yeah. Yep. Um, so I was considering looking into bands just for future use, nothing now, but does that require any gym equipment on top of bands or is it like even things to anchor to, or like, would they be around a barbell that I'm pressing or is it just pure band work? Pure, yeah. Ideally. Pure band. Yeah. Pure band work, but ideally you'd have like a pull-up bar or, uh, okay. uh, we also use like a, a bench. I tried not to like incorporate a bench. So there's ways around it, but, um, those, those would be the only two items like, uh, in addition to just having a band. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Thanks very much. And uh, Justin, thank you for all your hypertrophy and fat loss input. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your question. It was very relevant for me. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I'm here for you, bro. All right, man. Uh, all right. Thank you all. Oh, Thanks. um, Sal, one last thing. Uh, when I started listening, I wanted to uh, tell you this. Probably the hardest I've last laughed in the last year or so was your story about going into the woods with a milk jug and a barbell yeah. and squatting so you didn't go to school the next day. <laughs> yep. so. True story. Painful yeah. story. <laughs> you did fun All stuff. Right, well, I don't know. His pillow fights was the funniest for me. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I like the <laughs> shitting outside. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> that was my favorite. All right, Noah. Thank you, brother. Thanks, hey, we'll send that, right. we'll send that math 15 over to you, brother. All right. Thank you. Have you. A good one. You got All it, right. man.
Yeah, uh, that's this is a hard one for people to believe that they can do less. This is for fitness fanatics. Oh, I didn't okay? know that. I know. <clears throat> and you know what's fun? I, I still, even for me, like I, I literally, so if I'm training and I'm pushing volume, I'll do between 16 to 20 sets per body part per week total. Okay. I recently dropped everything down to nine sets. So that's pretty significant drop. That's like half. Mm -hmm. And what do you think is happening? I'm progressing. Yeah. Like every time, you know, so, um, it, 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 it's usually that you're overdoing it and doing less will probably get you better results, but at the worst doing less maintains. Not to mention when I, I know, I don't remember, recall what the, the group in that study that referred to the one seventh to maintain yeah. what their training experience is. But I would speculate that as that compound, so do the results and the, and the ease of being able to maintain meaning when you get someone like him who's been training for 15 years consistently like that, or like us, 20 plus years, it, it just gets even easier to maintain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I were to have stopped or fell off when I was 21, I had like, you know, made minimal gains. Well, there's not a lot to maintain because I haven't gained a lot because I had just started. But as you progress through years and add more and more training volume, add more and more muscle to maintain that becomes easier and easier. So a guy like this, I think he's going to be surprised when he reduces down to like a MAPS anabolic program, he'll probably stay just as fit or maybe even get fitter by he'll doing that. definitely is stronger, I, I could guarantee. Yeah. Next caller is Alicia from Ohio. Hey, Alicia, how can we help you? Hi, guys. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for having me on here. I've been listening to you guys since I started even touching weights. So like you've helped me throughout my journey of not even doing anything to now why I'm here. Awesome. Um, so I'll give you a little background. I've been doing your guys's powerlifting program. Um, I've ran through it twice now. Um, so I've been powerlifting for about two and a half years, training for about three years in that direction. Um, the first time I ran it, my squat went up tremendously, like 15 pounds. Bench went up. It was great. Deadlift did not change at all. Um, and then the second time I ran it, um, I was doing like a bulk through both of these phases back and back. So within that bulk, I like gained like 10 pounds and everything um, weight wise, but my deadlift didn't increase. It actually like, I couldn't even pull my one rep when I tested it just now. And then my squat went up like five pounds and then bench still goes up five pounds. But my basic question is, is with that and kind of being more experienced in everything, is there a way I can modify your guys's powerlift program to gear it towards increasing the squat and deadlift? and kind of breaking through that plateau or anything like that let's talk about where you're at right now first where are okay. you at where are you at in those three lifts uh so bench is about 240 right now whoa wait 240 you can pounds? bench 240 yes holy no shit way. That's well a, that's uh, I, already, I already have an idea what's going yeah, on anyway <laughs> keep going yeah keep going, going. too strong keep, keep going. Going. number <laughs> yeah we wrote these programs too effectively Good guys. Lord. <laughs> what's right. the next yeah. what are you doing what are you squatting uh, squats, they're not as impressive as the bench. They're only like three thirties. What I hit. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, okay. That's good. And What's your deadlift? deadlift is stuck at like three Oh nine, uh, okay. three ten. Maybe if I'm pulling like good, but like when I just tested it, I couldn't, I couldn't even lift like two ninety five okay. off the ground. So wow. how that's kind of where the numbers some great are numbers. Right how old are you? you? What? I'm 27. And you've been, and you've been powerlifting just for a few years. Yes. Yeah. These are Do you great. remember what you lifted when you first started? Um, when I very first started, like ever touching a weight, like just the bar would bruise my back. Like, and that was <laughs> oh like about God. four years ago. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, so, you, so here's so killing it. This is when it gets. This is when stuff gets uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. fun, but also potentially frustrating. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's fun because you're legitimately stronger than ninety nine percent of the of women in the world. Okay. That, those are those are numbers that I. I mean, I trained a lot of clients. I never had a female client that could lift that much except for like super high level yeah, competitive. Especially bench. Yeah. Like that's insane. Your bench press in particular. I don't think I've ever seen a woman bench no, that I've trained uh, in that realm. You should massive. check out like Jen Thompson. Yeah, I know. Yeah, there's, I know there's that people there's there, out but, there. Yeah, but my point is not, you should not, not actually check yeah. her out. You should yeah. not. Yeah, exactly. No Why compare? Yeah. You're talking about a one in a million yeah. person, maybe my, one my, in 10 million. My point is you're really strong. You've gotten to such a high level yeah. it's, that it's really hard. Everything's incremental now. It's really hard hard to progress um, from here. So, mm -hmm. okay. So you follow MAPS Powerlift. This is the second or third time through? 
Second time. And then do you do anything in between? Um, normally I take like a week off of rest. Okay. Um, Symmetry. Do you have a, do you have a specific competition coming up or something you're training for? I do have something coming up in November, November 15th. Oh, that's time. Um, so you I'm time. Yeah. hoping to get one more cycle in before then. Okay. So, so here, now here's the sticking point oftentimes for people at your level has to do with, um, imbalances, technique, mobility. Mm -hmm. You tend to improve some of that with someone like you. Um, and you start to see some, some power output, uh, improvements or increases like uh, unilateral training. Yes. Would probably benefit you really well. Now, during that period of time, you're not going to be lifting nearly as much as you normally do. And then when you go back to bilateral, you might initially find mm -hmm. that your strength is lower, but then because you've corrected certain imbalances uh, and, and improved your symmetry, right, from left to right, then you'll see mm -hmm. that you'll surpass um, some of your old lifts. I think you 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 that would probably do you really well. Yeah, I'd love mm -hmm. to see her run symmetry Absolutely. right now and then go back to power lift. Yeah, yeah, the problem is time though. I don't know if she has enough time for well, it. Well, that's right? okay. We have we're in what, what are we in June? We're in June. Okay, June, end of June. July, August, September, October, November. So you could technically go like symmetry months. right now, and then when she goes to the five by five, instead of going to the five by five in symmetry, go right go into right power lift. So yeah. skip the last phase of symmetry. Yep, and then get back into power lift. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you, where do you, now let me ask you this. Uh, obviously you, you, you're, you're strong. You've been doing this for a little while. Where do you feel the sticking points are for you? And do you feel pain anywhere? Like when you deadlift a lot, do you notice any issues? Um, like, um, talk me through so this. So I, I have had some like lower back pain, but, um, that was hmm. started like a year ago. So I've been training the core mostly to like help that, Good. um, and kind of stabilize that. And I've, adjusted my technique in order like i don't feel that anymore okay um I, but that was like previously and then it's just like getting it right off the ground is kind of like you pull sumo okay yeah yeah i pull sumo yeah sticking point for sumo is usually right you there. said you've you've experimented with deficit deadlifts a bit yes yeah, so this previous time um when i did the first phase i did uh deficits with like just the smaller like 25 pound ones that you see like at the commercial gym, um, mm -hmm. that was like about how much of a deficit I did. And then I just kept loading those up for those, there you for go. the first yeah. phase into like about halfway through um, power lift. You can also do pause. So mm -hmm. where you get, you take a weight that you can lift, lift mm -hmm. it two or three inches off the floor, pause for four or five seconds, and then finish mm -hmm. the lift. So you're pausing about two inches or two to four inches or two to six inches off the floor. And then, so you have to go lighter, much lighter to do that. Um, yeah. But that'll help build the the strength and tension yeah. in that lower part uh, of the rep. But I mean, single leg deadlifts and Bulgarian squats, yeah. I mean, are going to be fantastic for you just for like strengthening and stabilizing around your your hips and, and everything else. And it's just, that's one of those things mm -hmm. that I think a lot of powerlifters don't really consider. And then if, if you spend enough time there really strengthening that and then go back, it's going to be... Hopefully, it's going to be a mind-blowing thing. That, that would be my recipe with you going forward would be to interrupt after every, like, let's say you do a meet. Then right after a meet, I would run symmetry and then go back to power lift. Yep. And then I would run symmetry and then go back to power lift and run symmetry. That would be like a good formula. You can even do mass performance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's another program that might benefit you. Because you're at the level now where your limiting factor uh, is not is it has more to do with um, like these small imbalances or your body protecting itself because you're lifting a lot of weight. So if there's yeah. a little bit of instability and your body senses it, you're losing power, you're losing strength. You're going to prevent yourself. Now, what a lot of power lifters do is they try to push past it. This is when they start to get injured. Yep. Um, and you're in injury territory. I don't mean in, in the sense of your your technique is off, but you're so strong that if your form is off a little bit, like if your form was off a little bit and you were squatting 100 pounds, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, you're squatting 300 pounds yeah. as, a, as a female. If your technique is off a little bit, um, the risk of injury goes up quite a bit. Magnify it. Yeah, so we're going to send you map symmetry. Don't do the last phase. Just follow the first okay. few phases. And then when you get to the last phase, switch back to mass power lift. And I'd love to hear back from you. Oh, yeah. I'd love to hear back yeah. from you and how, how you feel and how, how it all worked out for you. Of course, that would be awesome. Thank yeah. you guys. No, and, and, and yeah, you're crushing it, man. Yeah. That's, that's super yeah, impressive. Congrats. Yep. Good job. One of the, if not the most nutrient dense foods on the planet, as defined by a food that contains every essential nutrient 
that you need to survive and live. In other words, you can eat this and be okay and eat nothing else. There's only one type of food that fits this category. It's meat. That's right, this is a fact, okay? This is unequivocal. Meat contains every single essential nutrient, macronutrient and micronutrient you need to live for your body to function. It's extremely nutrient dense. Now, just eating meat is not ideal, but removing meat from your diet, whoa, you better make up for that with other foods and typically supplements. So when you hear people say, hey, get rid of meat, don't eat meat, you need to do a lot of research and a lot of work to make up for all those nutrients you are missing when you stop eating meat. Bringing this up because the push. Brought to you by Big Beef. Yeah. The, <laughs> yeah I right. wish they sponsored us. That'd be awesome. I know, I'd be all for it. <laughs> Just throw us a steak every once in a while. Uh, <clears throat> I'm saying this because I brought this up on, on an earlier podcast about the UN is making a call to um, their, you know, their, uh, I don't know, member nations to reduce meat consumption, in particular America. Oh, I see. Now, now, here's the problem. Okay. Now, here's the problem with that. And those of us who work in the health space understand this. Okay. The average American consumes a majority of their calories from heavily processed foods. This is a fact. In fact, when you go to grocery stores, 73% of the calories in a grocery store, typical grocery <clears throat> store, this is confirmed, comes from heavily processed foods. The average American, a majority of their diet, is made up of heavily processed foods. When you look at the remaining whole natural foods, which is what we're always advocating for, I don't think anybody will say yeah. that a whole natural food diet- Meat, eggs, dairy. Is, it's meat, eggs, and dairy. Yeah. That's a majority. <laughs> They're not eating a lot of other whole natural foods. Yeah. It, that's pretty much it. So if you convince a bunch of everyday people who already don't plan their diets, who are already not health and fitness fans, the average person, Mm -hmm. And you just scare the hell out of them, or you tax meat into oblivion, or you ban meat and make it so people can't purchase it. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah. They're going to replace it They're with more deficient. of what they already eat a lot of, heavily processed foods. And what that will result in is a sicker population, a fatter population, a population with less muscle, with more anxiety, more depression as a result of nutrient deficiencies. Not a great trade so uh that's the reason why i'm bringing this up like, so i we, agree with you 100 percent on this my question i have for you though is do you subscribe to it being this big you know conspiracy to make people weaker and sicker or do you think it's it's less nefarious and it's just this is the easiest path to patenting food that we can make more money and control the food industry even more. Like where, what do you think? And I don't think that's a conspiracy. I think that's like the yeah, obvious path to yeah. me. I think that there's, there's a few different things at play. There's the, uh, the climate worshipers <clears throat> where they place the climate, right? Environment climate as, so I just, th I think those, value. I think to that point, I think those are just useful idiots. I think the agenda is still to make money and it's easy to, to, yes. to play to but that. But there's, there's, there's more than one thing that's making this happen. So that's one, right? One of them is- Cornering the market. People worship the climate. It's everything. Kill all the humans. Everything bends to this top value. Every other value is less than that. So if people are more sick, people have more anxiety, more depression, less innovative, et cetera, et cetera. Even people will even call humans a cancer uh, on earth is, is a common one. So that is part of it. Then you have- a lot of markets that profit off of people who are, who are not, quote unquote, balanced and healthy. Now, I don't necessarily think they sit down and say, we want people to be sick. But if you look at their products, their products are typically consumed by people who are less healthy or consumed more by people who are less healthy. So if you look at someone who's like, <coughs> think of someone who's fit and healthy and balanced, they're less likely to buy all these products consume as much of the same media, you know, basically do the same kind of stuff. So their incentives are in that direction. And then what you said, I think is a big one, which is uh, you can create lots of patented processed foods, GMO products, very profitable to do so. And if we need to sell it under the guise of- We're saving saves every, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, this is a, a value. It's great for everybody. It's good for the earth and therefore- let's do it, um, then then they'll do so. So I think there's there's multi-factors. Yeah, I think, I think it, <clears throat> we, we've seen like uh, a lot of examples of this in terms of like uh, low f low fat, like in, in eliminating fat out of your diet and like, you know, other like focuses in terms of like which foods that we all need to focus on. I feel like this, 
it's it's sort of a trends thing, right? And so it starts out as like veganism is um I, I've seen like a big movement and push in that direction. I, I have I've seen uh lately I've seen a lot of push back against it. And so you see like the carnivore kind of diet emerge, and then you see like people like swarming over to that. There was Atkins before. So I think that it <laughs> In terms of capturing the market and like capitalizing on that, I think that there was opportunity there now to like, we have the technology to make uh, this fake meat. And so like in order to get people to buy into it, we were going to force them in that direction. And so I think a lot of it is like now that, that there's more control over the way that consumers uh, get information and like, they, like we all have the same information on our phone, but they can control that a lot more. And you've seen them manipulate you know, algorithms and ways people like receive information. So the nefarious part for me is that it's like, you know, whether it's like trying to make a sick and all that kind of stuff. And it's like a real devious plot. Uh, I mean, you can go down that rabbit hole all you want, but I just think in terms of us having to uh, having access to information, like they can control a lot of the information we receive. And so to, to inform the consumers that this is the direction we need to go is an agenda that businesses have. Yeah. yeah I don't, I mean, I, uh, I don't, I don't think it's this crazy plot to make us sick. I think, I think that also just plays in the favor too of like that, that plays into the, uh, you know, the medical industry. Oh yeah. That's a huge market. So it's like, or, yeah. uh, you're not, so you have the food and the medical industry, like two of the biggest industries that are out there. And so it's like, oh, okay, well, we're going to get it. We're going to push them over to processed foods. That'll probably make them more sick. Yeah. You'll probably make more money. Look so at they're not, partnering now with GLP. Right. And the, so, yeah. you know, so you got the, you got, you got the medical community is not going to push hard back on it because yeah. they're just going to send them more customers. You yeah, got the I'm food industry. Help. It's in their best interest to make more money. That's right. So I do think like your point about like the zero fat, like movement that we had in like the late nineties or whatever like that. I think that's the same thing. I think it was driven by the same thing. I don't think it was, even though it ended up making people sicker and unhealthier, like we saw this firsthand, right? How many times did you have a female client after training them and then realizing like, oh shit, she's eating under 20 grams of fat, all these issues that she's having, all I had to do is bump her fat to 80, 90 grams a day. And all of a sudden, all everything these, goes away. Everything goes away. Yeah. So we saw firsthand how, what that started to do to people because they didn't know any better. <laughs> So I, I, I do think that, I think that was a result of it. I don't think that was a desired outcome. I think the desired outcome was, oh, let's create a new niche market of non-fat milk and fake butter and all this stuff like that. Well, look, I'll give you an example. Uh -huh. There was that study that showed, so when people get hospitalized for depression, it's pretty bad. Like you're, you're, you're pretty bad. They did a study where they had a group of, uh, they took groups of people who were hospitalized and they put them in rooms where the there was a window that faced uh, the east. Oh, I remember. So this. the rising sun would come and shine through the window. Yeah, they were in their they were hospitalized significantly less than people who weren't in <clears throat> rooms like that. Now, do you think it's in the best interest of these hospitals to build rooms that allow for more sunlight to come in with the rising? Do you think that that's in their best interest, or do you think it's in their best interest to have people stay a little longer? Yeah. Right. So I don't necessarily think people are like evil at the top, but the incentives don't move towards making people there's a, there's healthy. ethical issues there's definitely ethical issues that uh, you see like that and you're like no they would like somebody wouldn't like intentionally have those windows facing that way cuz they know that it'll keep them a little bit sick or but if you're looking at your bottom line and you're looking at um, the fact that a hospital is a business and like when they don't have patients, they're losing money all the time. And so, and two, with the whole COVID thing, it's like you see incentives for, for people to report things because it's <laughs> like, you know, you have to like make money at the end of the day in order to keep things afloat, pay your employees and all that kind of stuff. So you're making these justifications unethical dust justifications a lot of, like sometimes it, it's going to happen well incentives matter look I'll, I'll paint the picture just so people because people are like oh people aren't evil i know people who work in the medical industry they're good people so do i i think they're i've met i've trained and worked with lots of doctors i have family members that are nurses they're all amazing people they all want to help people so i don't think that there's these evil whatever i'm sure there's some but i think a majority of them are are good people but imagine this scenario presented you're a corporation you own these massive hospitals or you're uh, a medical organization that works with these hospitals. And a study comes out that says uh, sunlight, uh, if, you know, windows that face the east reduce hospitalization by this percentage. And then another study comes out that says taking this antidepressant at this time when people are hospitalized reduces hospitalizations. Which one do you think is going to get more attention? Yeah, the pill. 
Right. Which one is going to get more like uh, not just attention, but more adherence, more application? It, and it's not necessarily because people are um, nefarious. It's just that's what the incentives push you towards, right? So meat, uh, eating, and the studies are clear on this, very clear. Look at people who don't eat meat. Nutrient deficiencies are higher. Depression is higher. Anxiety is higher. Okay, this is a fact. It's a fact because of the lack of nutrient-dense foods. The nutrients that are present in meat are more easily absorbed. They're more bioavailable, and they're just they're just higher. In order to make up for that with a non-animal product diet, you can do it. You can do it. We have modern you know markets. You can go to the grocery store and get all kinds of different things now, any time of the year. Okay, but it takes a lot of planning. You got to be very careful, and even then. Even then, I've worked with clients like this where they were meticulous about their vegan diets. Even then, they couldn't get certain nutrient levels where they needed. And they begrudgingly, I remember one woman in particular, I worked with her. She was a vegan for ethical reasons. She did not want animals to get hurt. So she was one of those vegans that's like, and those are the ones that tend to be consistent, right? They really, really, truly believe like, I don't want animals to get hurt. And she, man, she planned everything out. She worked with a functional medicine practitioner and me. She hired me. She had all these symptoms of nutrient deficiencies and hormone issues. We bumped her calories. I had her try vegan protein shakes. Uh, it, it just, there were certain things that just weren't, weren't working. Okay. Her hair was still kind of falling out. Energy was still not so great. Nails and skin weren't so good. You know, functional medicine practitioners doing tests on her is like these nutrient levels still aren't coming up. She started taking supplements. The supplements helped a little bit, but they didn't help a lot. Um, some of them caused digestive issues. Finally, I mean, we had this, con her and I had this conversation and I said, you know, you're doing everything right. It's just not working for your body. I know you want to help animals. I said, I think a healthy version of you is going to be more effective than an unhealthy version. And you have to place yourself at the top. You can't be effective at helping anything if you're constantly sick and you don't feel good. And she was, I remember she was in, she was in tears. She gave in. And she started by eating eggs. And the difference in her health was profound. It was so profound that I remember she would come in and she was, she was like one of those people that was like pro-vegan, but also doesn't work for everybody and you got to do this type of thing. Mm -hmm. It's just hard. And so if you take a bunch of everyday Americans who don't plan anything with diet yeah. and you remove the nutrient-dense yeah, whole a problem foods, if, yeah. holy cow, we're going to have all kinds of health and mental health issues and health issues. And yeah, the food industry will profit massively, massive. By the way, the lab-grown meat, you know what's beautiful about lab-grown meat? You patent it. Mm -hmm. If my lab grows meat, I can make it <clears throat> yeah, you know, sows, ribeye, To whatever. me, that's the biggest, yeah. I think that's the the biggest thing going on here. It's just that it, they're moving in that direction yeah. and it's it's in their best interest. And so the, the narrative's going to be around why you shouldn't. And, I, you know, it's, I don't know. It's This is the, the challenge of free markets, right? That's yeah. in their best interest to make that money and put that message out. Only thing we can do is counter it with better information, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you, the question- Yeah, it's just our job to inform you know, people. Well, here's why I point people, just not to cut you off, but I point people to this. Uh, there are ways of raising animals that are far more ethical, uh, not like the conventional style. Um, you can uh, grass fed, it's more natural. Uh, with the beef, it's going to have better fatty acid profile. The animals are treated differently. Um, and thankfully, because of markets, yeah. you can now get it. And it used to be so expensive. Like Butcher Box, for example, look at the cost of the box of meat that you get. <clears throat> you're not spending more money. It's actually convenient. It's better. And you've got ethically raised, like wild-caught wild fish, grass-fed beef, heritage pork. You know where it's coming from. You, if you want, you can contact the company. Figure this all out. I was going to bring it's up. Healthier. I was going to bring up Butcher Box. Do you know if they're like? Are they campaigning against a message like this, or do they just ignore it? Yeah, do you that's know? an interesting question. That's yeah. a good question because it's like a direct shot across the bow yeah. at them, right? I mean, that's their business. I would now. almost, yeah, I would almost want to. And like, yeah, me too. I, I'm surprised. I don't think I've seen anything. At least I haven't heard anything from our end, like of them sending out stuff where they're like actually. Good question. I mean, you would think that they they would do that, or, or maybe at least a comparison, you know, and like right. look at the value of the nutrients and whatnot you know or maybe there's enough the people or, that are subscribed and and that are are not even that are not even listening to that message that it doesn't it's not hurting them like that but i would think that it would affect their business i mean i don't know yeah. I, I maybe heard. not yet but maybe in the future you know my favorite part of this whole movement is have you seen yeah people are, people are actually doing this have you seen these uh vegan cat foods 
Oh God, yeah, <laughs> dude, you're taking a carnivore. <laughs> they're not even. They're just like a carnivore. Yeah. And you're like, I'm gonna make you eat. You know, vegan that's stuff. animal it's cruelty right pork, there. Yeah. Like, come on, man. They're oh. not. Yeah, it's it's not benefiting these poor animals. Oh, at what, all. Is, what did that say right there, Doug? So yeah, so we partner. This is Butcher Box, according to them. We partner with people who are dedicated to doing the right thing. Uh, so they always do 100 percent grass fed, grass finished humanely raised, never given antibiotics or hormones. Um, so they do focus very seriously. So I, 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 I have a super naive question. What is the difference between like a grass fed farm? And I should know this, right? Cause I was in the dairy and farm industry. What is the difference between like a grass fed uh, beef farm versus a regenerative? Is it the same thing? Is so if you are doing grass fed, is it considered a regenerative farm or is, is they, there, they, they're typically, if, if they're typically, uh, yes, but they're not always the same. So you could Can just look that up for me, Doug. I'm just yeah, curious. They could just okay. bring uh, um, grass to the to the cows, have them eat. Um, I see. Or regenerative is when they're using the land and cycling through and using all of the land, using the manure to fertilize. So they uh, sort of cycle where they eat. Yeah, I think they move them from pasture. Them to pasture. No, I know that about grass fed beef. That right. I'm familiar with. That, what I'm not familiar with is what constitutes it regenerative Look versus that. that. Regenerative. Okay. Because I actually am not familiar with any situation where you bring grass to cows. You wouldn't do that. Yeah. You would. I, you you would you would feed them silage and you would feed them cornmeal and stuff like that. Does that That's, incorporate more of the ecosystem of other animals and stuff? Stuff to kind of like yeah, they, tra they trample through. the ground and they and they no, that's what I've read. That's yeah. what uh, what's his name talked about? Rob Wolf. Rob Wolf. Yeah, yeah. look yeah. that up. Look up because what is regenerative farming? farming? There's there's other animals that play a, a big role in that in order to like keep um, a lot of the vegetation and stuff uh, in the soil, for instance. From uh, I just know it's become sure a real popular buzzword in, in that community. And I mean, I'm I came from an organic dairy, so and we we moved the cattle like from pasture to pasture they were grass fed but we also uh they were able to grain finish those those cows but the, what i didn't know the difference is like okay what makes it regenerative versus non-regenerative if it's if you are going an all organic route you're going all grass fed would that just automatically fall in that category or yeah, not? what does that say doug well i'm looking at this trying to get a an answer that's kind of clear uh but what they're saying is is it really is just the ability to roam freely um, that's the main point that I'm seeing as far as that okay. is concerned. Yeah, I'm no, I mean, for sure, every time we do something like this, where we're not, none of us have a definitive answer, <sighs> I will get 50 DMs. Yeah, I'm sure yeah, I got it. <laughs> my, no, no, get, no. A, get a legit so, farmer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 I got it. I got it. Says regenerative agriculture. Oh, look at right there. Who's got this? Is that you, yeah. Andrew? Oh, okay, good. All right. So what? Look at look at the, look at. There's three here. So, so go to go to 100 regenerative grass fed beef. What does that say up there? Then, Can someone read that or maybe expand that? Top point just says genuinely. Regenerated and 100% grass-fed beef comes from animals that lived on pasture, foraging on nothing but grasses from birth to harvest. Okay. The true definition of grass-fed and grass-finished. Uh, well, look at the one on the right, though. Right next to it is what is what's considered uh, grass-fed, but not. So go go. Yeah, grass-fed beef right here. A lot of fake grass-fed beef is meant to mean genuine, regenerative, and 100% grass-fed beef comes from animals that lived on pasture. But okay, but this is not always the case meant to have access to a pasture, but not always the case, and could be extremely limited. Many grass-fed cattle are in refinement, but fed some grass. Yeah, see, that's what I thought. Like, they literally throw it in their feed. I see. So I was actually reading from the Butcher Box page there, and, uh, you know, it says, if you're buying grass-fed beef, you're maybe not getting what you think you are. Typically, grain-fed or grass-fed cattle start their lives on pasture, but are later confined to feedlots where their diets can include grains. Wow! So they can so they can consider it still grass-fed if mm -hmm. they started their life on that. And That's then, why it has to say grass-fed. Oh, okay. So grass-fed, grass-finished cattle, also known as 100% grass-fed, are free to roam on pasture for their entire lives, not just when they're calves. Do you know what? So I I always thought that mm -hmm. the so the the cutoff. I thought I don't know. So like this is more more questions that would be, somebody else can answer better. That if it was grass fed, as long as they, they could do it all the way, they had to do it all the way up to their final like two weeks before slaughter, and then they would they would fatten them up by mm -hmm. and putting grain and silage and everything in their feed. But they still were most of their lives, I thought, grass fed. But from what that sounds like, you don't even need to do that. They it's all the way through. Yeah. There's a lot of trickery going yeah. on. Yeah, you can literally, you know, that's the shitty part about the, you know what I'm saying? And that's the argument the other side makes for this I stuff. I don't think, is it two weeks out? I think it's longer than that. No, that's, I mean, that's what I, I in order to still like call. How, would that be enough time to change the fat in the Two animal? weeks of overeating? 
It would. Oh yeah. With yeah. cows. With the, it, humans too. Anybody. I mean, you. I mean, you, I've tried to bulk like that. It's you. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have another gear, bro. They can handle a lot. I mean, of food, you. Dude. I. You could. I remember scooping grain and silage to a cow. Like they'll eat whatever you put in front of them. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. They'll. They'll go. They'll continue to just eat. In fact, I can't remember. Recall a time. Oh, well, if a cow, that's how you knew a cow was sick, right? So if you pour their, especially the grain and silage, which they love, you pour that in their in their trough, I mean, they suck it down. If they left something, you always tag that cow. Something's wrong with 487. You know, something's wrong with 519. Like, they didn't finish their, wow. their you just know. Like Did you they, help them uh, produce, like, calf? Like, how do you, do you have, what, what do you have, one bull for how many cows? How did that work? One. One bull, and then that was, I mean, we only had for a how herd, many cows? We only had a, we only had a herd of 150. 50 something one bull so we for small... 150 cows yeah 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 <laughs> well they so so they, you gotta remember that the heifers only come in they only come in heat they, they're just they come in heat at different times so let's say you have like 15 in heat you see the signs that they're in heat then you move what them are the in signs uh i don't remember what uh i didn't this is not a part that i did a lot of like i i, I had they stand I, different <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I mean, honestly, I, I think I remember you seeing like like blood and stuff coming. coming oh, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. You would see, you would, yeah, mm -hmm. like discharge and stuff uh -huh. like that. If I recall, like, I don't, and then what do you what do you, do? you just bring the bull in? He knows what to do. Yeah, yeah. Saying. You just you you just pasture them off in this in the same area. He's normally kind of hanging out by himself, but then when they're in heat, you move them in where they're in heat, and he'll go around and he'll 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 it fuck is, them all. Oh, huh? yeah, yeah. He'll he'll take it. I mean, it's a real quick action. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like. You don't even realize, like, really? Well, he's just, got 150, you know. Yeah. He ain't yeah. trying to take his time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and it, wow. You, yeah, that's an interesting question, too. I never I never thought to ask, like, what is the ratio? Like, there's got to be a point where you get more, where you want more, more. But we hit, we were a small dairy. We only had 100, 130 to 150 cattle. I didn't know that, but there's still one bull for that many? Holy Toledo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. wow. That's a good, I, I've never hmm. thought about what the number, there's got to be a cutoff, though. Like, once you get to a certain amount, you would want a yeah, second. Yeah, the bull's just like, dude, yeah, relax. Yeah, I would. I would Do you ever have ideas of like, I, so when I was in Scotland, they had these like uh, um, cows that, would they had these longhorn cows that were like super oh, sweet. Yeah. Oh, man, I was like, I could totally like own a few of those guys. Oh, you they're know? huge. The yeah. horns are huge. They actually have mini versions of them now. That's I saw. cute. Yeah, yeah, it was ridiculous. I, so look what it says. So I was right. It was so Signs of heat standing to be mounted, mounting other cows. Wow. So yeah, you'll see the so heifer. So cow will do it to no, other yeah, cows? You'll see, yeah, you'll see other heifer, just like you see with dogs, right? Male, two male dogs or two, you'll see them uh, mounting well, each other. Well, those are heat and cattle, not the bulls. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. Oh, okay. Same thing. You see the same sex of a dog. If, if they're yeah, in heat, yeah. they start doing, they start acting. But the big one is the mucus discharge. You'd see this mucus discharge uh -huh. and it would have a little bit of blood in it and you would know. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Okay, it's time. Bellowing. Okay, so they are like, yeah, doing see, nothing. I know. Yeah. Wow, that's wild. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible, but not if you guess along the way. So we're going to talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now, there's a huge range right of like body types yeah you know, some people can run uh a little bit heavier uh and or a little bit higher body